welcome to the Wayne County Board of Commissioners uh, regular meeting for May 19th, 2020. I'd like to remind us uh, that we're still under the restrictions that the, of the governor mandates no more than 10 persons gathered in one place. And as such, the public may watch the meeting from the jury room on the third floor or at www.wayngov.com. Those wishing to speak during the public comment session will be asked to wait in the jury room until escorted to the meeting by a deputy. I'd also like to say this morning that we uh, we need to, uh, Commissioner Gurley is not going to be able to be with us. He does have a doctor's appointment today. Uh, we continue to, to pray for his recovery. And uh, I also want to uh, say at this time that, uh, oh, I forgot. I needed to say also, remind our commissioners again about our uh, summer dress. You do not have to wear a tie during our summer months, uh, but if you want to do like Commissioner Acock and say, look, I'm sitting in Commissioner John Bell's seat, he always wore a tie, then Mr. Acock is an exception. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we appreciate that. Um, so at this time, uh, we have the invocation uh, by Commissioner Acock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for all your many blessings. We ask that you be with us today as we make the decisions for the citizens of Wayne County that we think our process through and try to make the best decision and the right decisions. We also need to remember our first responders, our health care givers during this time of the virus. Also be with our men and women in uniform. We are a military family in Wayne County. And be with our military personnel that's deployed all over the world. We ask that you be with the leaders of our state to make the right decisions, and the leaders of our nation to make the decisions in this very trying time. We also would like to remember the Gray family, the New Hope community, for the loss of a very special person to them. And we also would keep uh, Commissioner Gurley in our prayers. Uh, we wish him a speedy recovery and be with his family. Just be with all of the citizens of the county. Keep them safe. We ask this in your name. Amen. 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 Mr. Payton. Please stand and place the flag. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Payton. Um, I also wanted to mention uh, real quickly um, that um, we're, we're, again, we're glad to have uh, Commissioner Worrell with us. I know that you've been through a pretty good orientation uh, the last few weeks, so uh, you know, you, you you hit the ground running whether you wanted to or not, right? That's right. <laughs> Good to have you with us. <clears throat> okay, we have uh, the approval of the minutes from May 5th, of 2020. If you've uh, uh, read those, if uh, there's any deletions or changes that be, need to be made. Motion to approve. Okay, we have a motion to approve. Uh, the minutes from May 5th. All in favor, raise your right hand, please. Okay, it's unanimous. Uh, Mr. Honeycutt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We do have two changes we would like to recommend for the agenda at this time. Number one is under special presentation. If we could take out number two, presentation from GWTA Executive Director Don Willis on fare increases. They are not ready at this time to make that presentation. And so we'll remove that. And then we need to add under consent agenda, uh, number four, motion to approve wages application for the COVID-19 CARES Act grant. And this is funding that they need uh, for that. And also we need to add uh, after uh, our budget work session, the setting of a public hearing 
for June 2nd for the Wayne County uh, fiscal year budget. Okay. And our, our one o'clock budget work session it's going to be sort of by ear. Yes, sir. It, it's kind of be fluid. We also have Davenport uh, that will be here as well and kind of give us an update on our financial situation of where we're at, uh, especially during all this time of uh, COVID and, and moving forward. Did the commissioners have any uh, changes to the agenda? I have a motion to approve the agenda? Absolutely. Okay, we have a motion to approve it. With the changes. With the changes. Okay, with the changes. All in favor, raise your right hand, please. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Tony Cut. Um, first, we'll have an update on open broadband from CEO Alan Fitzpatrick. Uh, is he here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, we do not have Mr. Fitzpatrick here. Um, hopefully he will be coming. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, work that's been done by Open Broadband, especially with the remote learning that we're having with our kids. And there's also some grant opportunities. So um, hopefully he'll be here today and we'll be able to talk about that. Uh, since we're not doing number two, number uh, the second on the agenda is motion to approve 2020 EMS week proclamation. And Dave Cutterback, who is our EMS director, will be reading that resolution and proclamation. If you, if you got, yeah, he does. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for putting some time aside for us today. Week started off a little tough, but it is still EMS week. Uh, we supported the, the Gray family yesterday, uh, as we will continue to do so. Uh, Jason is one of our paramedic supervisors. He's a team member of ours, a family member of ours, and we will continue to support that family during this time. It is EMS week, EMS week proclamation, whereas emergency medical services is a vital public service and Whereas the members of emergency medical services teams are ready to provide life-saving care to those in need 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And whereas access to quality emergency care dramatically improves the survival and recovery rate of those who experience sudden illness and injury. And whereas emergency medical services has grown to fill the gap of providing important out-of-hospital care, including preventative medicine, follow-up care and access to telemedicine and whereas emergency medical services systems consist of first responders, emergency medical technicians, paramedics, emergency medical dispatchers, firefighters, police officers, educators, administrators, pre-hospital nurses, emergency nurses, emergency physicians, trained members of the public and other out-of-hospital medical care providers and Whereas the members of emergency medical services teams, whether career or volunteer, engage in thousands of hours of specialized training and continuing education to enhance their life-saving skills. And whereas it is appropriate to recognize the value and accomplishments of emergency medical services providers by designating Emergency Medical Services Week now. Therefore, the Wayne County Board of Commissioners, in recognition of this event, do hereby proclaim the week of May 17th through the 23rd, 2020, as Emergency Medical Services Week. With the theme, Ready Today, Prepare for Tomorrow, we encourage the community to observe this week with appropriate programs, ceremonies, and activities. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I'll make the motion that we accept the proclamation. Okay, we have a motion to approve the 2020 EMS week uh, proclamation. Is there any discussion or comments? Just thank you all for what you do. Thank you, sir. Keep, keep not only not work. only your people, but all the other volunteer agencies and yeah, all that was mentioned in this is yeah. y'all are about a part of our staying healthy. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what you do, your, your front line. Uh, we have a, any other comments? Okay, we have a motion on the floor 
Uh, all in favor of the 2020 EMS Week Proclamation, raise your right hand, please. Okay, we are unanimous. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yes. So last week they came to get me and looked after me, and Dave was kind enough to come out to the hospital to make sure that I got home. <laughs> well, I'm that's most appreciative. Most definitely. That's that, that's that's going outside of the norm. That, absolutely. Know? Yeah. Not not for not for Dave. It's not. <laughs> well, I, I know, but I'm saying that's what Wayne County does. That's what Wayne County EMS is all about. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. Um, next is uh, we have uh, approval of the agreement between the Wayne County Board of Education and Wayne County with respect to emergency shelters. Uh, I do want to thank Aaron. I want to thank uh, also our attorneys as well. We basically have had agreements with the school system in verbal, but they've never been in writing. So Aaron has done an incredible job of really coordinating this with uh, the Board of Education and their staff as well. So uh, with that said, and now um, being pre-hurricane hurricane season, I'll let Aaron go to the agreement for you. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Um, so somehow I'm getting credit for a lot of other people's actually hard work during this. Um, when I first started, one of the things that big concern was shelters, but with the school district, um, our attorneys here, as well as DH DSS, health department and facilities, we went through, got all the verbal agreements that we've had in the past, and finally put it down on paper and made some improvements. Um, the work that we've done, we now have um, six shelters, two in the northern part of the county, central part of the county, and southern part of the county. Three primaries, two secondaries to move forward. So a lot of work went into finally getting these verbal agreements down on paper. Um, so we'll have something going forward um, for the next five years for this one. Um, so we're going to be, the schools have agreed to let us use their facilities as emergency shelters during any type of disaster, usually used during hurricane season. Um, we'll, have, we'll have school support for the first initial feedings and openings, and then we'll have DSS and health department folks in there taking care of the shelter population, and along with sheriff's department. Um, and Goldsboro PD and the other police departments providing security. So, and then running everything out of the emergency operations center just in case they need anything. So there's still a little bit of uh, tweaks and adjustments that do need, need to be made to this agreement. So it's not a final approval until we get it through the county manager, board of elections, and the legal teams here. But going forward, we've got a good plan. And so I keep saying now it's now it's finally on paper. Um, the second part of the agreement is something that um, I've been working on with some help from county agencies uh, regarding the 2020 hurricane season. As of right now, we are taking the coronavirus into account and how we can do emergency operations more safely. We do have the luxury over at the Jeffries building that we had three stories. We have three conference rooms on there. We can spread out emergency operations a little bit better. So if it's not noted here on the on the plan, emergency operations will continue as, as normal. This plan has not been finalized as well, so when to hear some feedback from municipalities as well as uh, North Carolina emergency management. So I'll hope to have this done by the end of the month before hurricane season officially starts. Uh, for any questions? Any questions? And, and again, as Aaron said, I, I think there's still some minor tweaks that will not change the, the schools or anything, but just uh, some minor issues with feeding and maybe some cafeteria workers that the school system and our attorneys will work out for the final agreement. So if you are so inclined, we would ask that you approve this contingent upon final approval by a county attorney. Okay. Have, has the schools actually already agreed to this? They had, and they had submitted one change that is going back and forth between Andrew and their legal. So they have seen this. They made one minor change towards the back, and that was it, sir. Great. Okay. Any questions? Just uh, thank you for giving in writing, because, you know, we've, we've been burnt before with this verbal stuff. Mm -hmm. Years ago, a person's word was good enough but it's not in this day's time it's not but thank you for getting this on on paper so we got a leg to stand on now yes sir 
<coughs> okay. Uh, mo mo we have a uh, motion on the floor to approve uh, the um, agreement between the Wayne County Board of Education and the Wayne, uh, County of Wayne for emergency shelters. Uh, contingent on yes, uh, uh, approval by for the county attorney? Yes, sir. Okay. Is that all we need, Mr. Parker? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So we have a we have a motion on the floor. Is there any other discussion or comments? All in favor, raise your right hand, please. The motion passes. Thank you. Right. Thank, Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Honeycutt. Uh, next, we'd have public comments and yeah. We have a motion to approve the application for wages first. Oh, that that's under consent. Oh, I yeah. put it in the wrong place. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Yeah. yeah, that's under consent. Yeah. Whoops. Did uh, did did you want to recognize someone in our audience? Um, later. later. Okay. Yes. <laughs> later. <laughs> yes, yes, sir, if that's okay. <laughs> yes. I mean, Andrew seems like he needs to be recognized. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to go into public comment. Eric? Yeah, we're waiting, waiting, for, for, waiting for the deputy. Wow. Hey. That's okay. You got my that's okay. I will, I will, um, I will announce, I will announce the restrictions and so forth when, once we have somebody come in. many we have for public comment? I think maybe just one. Just one? Okay. I know one for sure. Okay. We're going to need to go back in the closed session? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> I thought we would. <laughs> Sausage biscuit, don't we? Got any left, Kara? Yeah. 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 They were good. Where did they come from this morning? Bojangles. Oh, okay. They, they did come from Bojangles, yeah. Before you begin, I want to uh, say that we are in the public comment session. We have a maximum of 30 minute time period that we have allotted. I want to remind uh, all individuals that are speaking that you have four minutes and uh, you must give your name, address, and telephone number. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm here to ask for help. I live across from Bosco Beach, but I also live across from county property. The dust out there is terrible, and a large percentage of it's coming off the county property. I cannot get anybody to help me, and it needs to stop. Can y'all help? I want to ask, does Bosco Beach have that land leased? The FEMA land? Can anybody give me a yes or no? We are not allowed to give comments during the public time. 
uh, none of us can answer this. Okay. Uh, I want to make you aware of the fact that in the lease agreement on the FEMA land, you're not allowed to uh, burn Bosco Beach is burning down there on that land. Uh, I want to tell you about a case, a homeless case out there. And I believe your county manager is aware of it because I called him and talked to him. They were not allowed to park a little, they had a little camper and a tent and they were living in it a man and his wife and three children. Uh, they were told that they had to move or they were gonna be locked up. I was able to get them a place to go through the Salvation Army, okay? But yet, Bosco Beach is allowed to park campers on county property. That's wrong. Okay, uh, you're not allowed to treat one person better than the other. Uh, can I put a FEMA, uh, a camper on FEMA property? Y'all not gonna say yes or no. But if I can't put it on the land, a camper, and rent it out on FEMA land that I have got leased, then nobody else should be able to do it either. Uh, and according to the lease that I have, uh, you're not supposed to have improper noise or any uh, unpleasant odors coming from it, anything that's annoyed to the residents in the community. Uh, you're not allowed to change the surface of the ground and Bosco Beach has already done that. I can prove it. You're not allowed to do anything on the property that would cause injury or casualty. And I can prove that uh, off of the FEMA land, I have seen the rescue squad go into there and take people out. Now, if that is the case, then y'all need to get your act together. I thank you for your time, and I want something done about the dust. Thank you, Ms. Downey. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so um, we have anyone else for for public comment? Okay. <clears throat> All right, I declare our public comment section closed, and. Uh, we have a appointment committee, um, Ms. Daycock. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have four uh, agencies that we recommend. This is recommending these uh, people for our uh, first to vote on at our next meeting. First of all, we'd like to reappoint to the uh, ABC board, Mr. Eflin Sager and Mr. Dave Meadow, Meadow to the Wayne County ABC board, and that's in form of a motion. You want to act on one of the, uh, all of these at one time, or? Yeah. You just, just okay, yeah. all right. Yeah, we'll vote on the next one, right. sir. The second one, we, want, we need to appoint uh, make recommendation, Mr. Brent Heath, to the Wayne County Transportation Authority, and that's in form of a uh, recommendation from the nominating committee. Okay. Next, uh, Mr. David Harold Overman, appointed to the Third Fire Fire Department Fire Commission. This is uh, their tax commissioners to oversee their tax that they receive from the county. And he is replacing Mr. Joe Tucker, who passed away. And next, we uh, would like to recommend, this is a reappointment, 
uh, Mr. David Jackson to the Wayne, Kent, Wayne Community College Board of Trustees. Uh, th and like I said, this is a reappointment. And this is for our, our vote on these at our next meeting. That's the recommendation of the appointment committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taycott. <clears throat> so we will have this list in our packet for next meeting for us to uh, vote on. <clears throat> okay, Mr. Honeycutt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, next is our consent agenda, and you have the four items under our consent agenda that we went over in our pre-agenda meeting, and we would ask for that to be approved. Mr. Chairman, yes. I move uh, approval of the consent agenda. <clears throat> okay, we have a motion to approve. Uh, the consent agenda uh, agenda is there are there any comments or changes from the board members all in favor of the consent agenda raise your right hand please okay that's unanimous thank you uh thank you chairman uh next under new business is the discussion of uh, budget work session uh, again, uh, after the formal part of this meeting, we'll be having a uh, discussion with Davenport. We'll be discussing uh, outlines of the proposed budget. And again, we're looking at holding the budget public hearing uh, at our next meeting, which will be June 2nd. So, uh, but we, I want to thank Allison. I also want to thank Janice for the work that's been done uh, and Chip as well to get us to this point. Uh, but we'll uh, kind of delve into it uh, uh, after our regular meeting and during the work session. Yeah. Uh, the next is motion, uh, number two is motion to adopt resolution 20 2019, resolution adopting the Noose River Basin Regional Hazard Mitigation Plan. And I will turn that over to our planning director, Mr. Barry Gray. Good morning. Good morning. This um, hazard mitigation plan um, is actually an update of our existing plan. We are required by FEMA to update this plan every five years. Um, so we are currently in that cycle. Um, we are required to update the plan. Otherwise, um, the county will not be eligible for federal funding for disasters. Um, and so that is important that we, um, um, we do this and we go through this exercise, of course. Um, there is a resolution that is provided to you. Um, if you want me to read that, I will. Otherwise, it is available for you um, to review. Um, we have held several public input sessions um, on this uh, with our neighboring counties. This is a combined plan with some of our neighboring counties, Green, um, Jones, Lenore, and Pitt County. So it is a regional plan. Um, this process has taken about 14 months to go through, so this is the, the end of the road for, for this update, um, so to speak. Um, if you do have any questions for me, I'll be glad to answer those. Any questions? We're required to update that plan every five years, correct? That's right. Yeah. What's the preface of the board? Motion to approve. Yeah. Okay, we'll have, have a motion to approve um, the New Shore River Basin Regional Hazard uh, Mitigation Plan. Uh, is there any discussion or comments? All in favor, raise your right hand, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Acott. <laughs> <laughs> he was a little late raising it then. I was, I was looking up something else. Yeah, I know. Uh, uh, motion, uh, motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Uh, next is uh, county manager's comments. And before we get into that, I wanted to turn over to Ken Stern, uh, kind of give us an update on where we're at and things going on with respect to COVID. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Luckily, I got my report done early this morning, so these numbers are uh, fresh from this morning. Uh, total cases in Wayne County as of this morning is 867. Of those, we have 248 active cases that we're currently uh, tracking. Um, there are 330 that are in uh, congregate living at this time, and we've had a total of 16 deaths in Wayne County that were COVID-19 related. Did you say 850 what? 867 total cases. 867. Yes, okay. of those, uh, 469 of those are in uh, news corrections. We have uh, 49 cases um, related to Genesis, uh, five on Brookdale and Berkeley, uh, two on Brookdale Country Day, which is 
over two incubation periods passed, so that's no longer considered an outbreak. That's a cumulative number from the outbreak that they have. Um, uh, currently tracking outbreaks at Oberry Center, where we have 11, and uh, Cherry Hospital, where we have one uh, patient there and uh, four staff that are, reside in Wayne County at Cherry Hospital. So those are uh, the uh, outbreaks that we're, we're uh, tracking now. We continue to do uh, uh, contact tracing of the health department. We've got a lot of people working on that. The staff is working real hard to get up with folks that are positive and determine who their contacts are, their close contacts, and following up with them, encouraging them to uh, isolate at home or self-quarantine and, and take whatever precautions they need to take to try to minimize the spread. So I'll entertain any questions if you have any. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> Could you run back through the numbers and just basically talk about what I'm looking for are the number of active cases that are in the community currently that are not in, what would you call it? Uh, congregate living. Congregate living facilities, which would include News Cherry, yeah. News Correction, any of those. Right. So, Right now, we currently have 248 active cases uh, in Wayne County. Those are those that are, are not in congregate living and those that are, uh, are um, other than that, the others are already considered uh, recovered. We have 603 estimated recovered in the county, and that includes the news correction inmates as well as uh, those that are in congregate living and those in the community, that's 603. So there are 248 active cases that are within the community, not in congregate living. Correct. Two hundred forty eight that you know of. Correct. Current positive cases. Okay. My next question is I'm reading where there are uh, sites now available where people can go and actually get tested. Do you have to have any symptoms, referrals, or anything in order to go to these sites? Most of those sites that are uh, that the DP, uh, DPH lists on the DHHS website about uh, testing sites right, throughout right, the state. Right, right. Um, if it's a private provider site, uh, then the doctor can use their discretion as to whether they want to test you, whether you're asymptomatic or not, and that could depend on whether you're a close contact to a to a known uh, positive case. Um, the state lab, of course, uh, would only will only if you're going with a state lab versus a contract lab. They would only take uh, certain criteria for testing for the state lab, and those are symptomatic folks that have symptoms that are um, um, that are um, compatible with COVID-19. Uh, those those are symptomatic folks that are hospital patients, healthcare workers, or first responders, persons who live in or have regular contact with a high-risk setting, persons who are at high risk of illness. Uh, and for whom a clinician has determined that results would inform clinical management or it will change how they're being treated, uh, uninsured patients that are symptomatic, and uh, post-mortem specimens from patients whom uh, COVID-19 was suspected but not confirmed prior to death. And those are the, the six categories where the state lab, who the health department works with, we work with the state lab primarily, uh, would take uh, samples for. I think you basically just asked the question. That is, the impression was kind of given as if anybody that wanted to get a test could go get a test. Uh, and they listed the health department, but people can't just walk to the health, I mean, go to the health department and get a test arbitrarily. No, they cannot. Okay. They can, they can call us at the health department, let us know what their symptoms are. We can uh, coordinate testing with them uh, with another provider or, or, uh, with the, uh, or with us, depending on the criteria they have and our availability of test kits. And, and I, I agree with Joe um, here because the same at the hospital has not really changed. The article was misleading and made, made it, it sound like you could just walk in the right, hey, I want to test. That's yeah. not the way it is. I think what they're stating is anyone who needs tested That's can get symptomatic tested. And then but they don't them. really, uh, in the press, they don't really give a, it's still, a operational well, it's definition saying, of what There's a limited needs number of tested. tests still available out there. Yeah, and that's increasing. They're getting yeah, uh, a lot more that's testing good. supplies, collection supplies uh, that uh, the health departments and providers can order. 
They've got a, um, I don't know the quantity, but I know the state is getting a, a lot of test kits from the federal government uh, that, they're, uh, that they'll be able to distribute to those that order them through the state lab. It's the 248 actual cases in one county. It's, how does that compare from two weeks ago? Is, is, there, is the number going up? Um, well, we've had, two weeks ago, it was before the uh, before uh, DPS reported that all the uh, inmate cases at News Correction had uh, passed their uh, incubation period in the quarantine and have since recovered. Right. So there's quite a spike there, it, uh, but um, it's still comparable. We're still getting uh, uh, new cases uh, daily. Uh, just over the weekend, I think one day we had like 23 cases, another 24 cases, and that's uh, more folks are getting tested, contacts are getting tested, and a lot of those are coming out of some of the uh, meat processing plants where there are identified outbreaks. Okay. Another question that raises another question. Those outbreaks at the plants, is there not a good chance that they're probably seeing their co-workers outside of the plant and that's how they're getting infected as opposed to being affected while on the line? Well, the, the cases that we have that are tied to those outbreaks are not just the employees, um, but also like their immediate family that subsequently may get it from that employee when they come mm -hmm. home. So I don't know that they're getting it from the plant, but with the amount of uh, numbers that they have uh, some of these plants, it's, you know, you can make that assumption, which is assumption isn't a good word, but uh, uh, by the rate of infection in some of those plants <coughs> and they're difficulty in meeting yeah. uh, uh, social distancing on the line and things like that. Because I hope they've taken, I'm sure they've taken steps at all these uh, plans to they distance and plexiglass and all that kind and of thing. The Department thing. of Agriculture who regulates those plants have been involved with them as well, making sure they're, they're meeting CDC guidelines and the guidelines from the Department of Agriculture. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Well, How many hospitalizations did you say we had? I did not. I don't have that number on my report. I think uh, the last time the hospital report was, I think, was 19. Was I it think it was 22. Uh, the total since the start was about 60. Was the last time no, but how many COVID are currently? COVID-19 hospitalizations oh, currently? Hospitalized, about 19. About 19. I thought she told us at our meeting 22, so that may have gone up and down a little bit. This was our telecopters last yeah. week. But that's, that's still relative to a small number. So out of the active some of cases of 248, you got about 2022. 20, I, mean, um, I was trying to find them on my phone. So about eight eight percent of the active cases are hospitalized. Is that what I'm seeing? Yeah. We uh, listening to the national national media week. Uh, the food, some of the food processing place in Nebraska and out that way are having problems uh, with their employees testing positive. How well, are we, how are we doing in our region? As far as, our, well, right now um, we have, um, the effect in Wayne County anyway, we've got six um, uh, food processing plants that are affected by some level of outbreak, whether it be uh, uh, just a few cases to a lot of cases. And I'm not naming those today because I don't know if the state has put those out, actually named those plants yet, so I'm not going to give those today. But, but uh, we are affected in this county. Uh, and these the numbers are assigned to the county. There could be a uh, meat processing plant that's in another county, but if they reside in Wayne County, then those are our numbers because they'll, they're coming home from work here and they're, they're uh, quarantining or isolating themselves here in Wayne County. Once those individuals are identified, they are quarantined. quarantined. Yes, they're, once they once they get a positive result, then uh, our staff, the health department, our contact tracers will reach out to them, make sure they're following the doctor's instructions on isolating themselves at home, get contact information on any of their close contacts, either within the home or outside the home that they're, you know, within close contact to, uh, based on the six foot for uh, more than a few minutes, and then we reach out to those contacts and have them uh, quarantine themselves. Uh, also for uh, or for a two-week period of time to make sure they don't develop symptoms and, and so on. We've got, uh, oh, probably at least 10 folks doing contact tracing uh, um, on a full-time basis 
Uh, we have nurses, we have lab techs, we have our interpreters that are helping, we have our administrative staff as well that's calling these folks routinely. And they even develop relationships with these people. They call them so much to, see, to check on them, make mm -hmm. sure they're doing okay, and make sure they're doing what they need to do. Any other questions? Comment? Thank you. Um, Thank you. Well, Mr. Kim, please don't go anywhere yet. Um, and, and I appreciate uh, uh, Dave and Aaron being here as well. There are not many people that would come back in a, on an interim basis in the middle of a pandemic. Ken wasn't in the middle. It, well, <laughs> but at the beginning, at the beginning of a pandemic. Uh, you know, uh, our uh, health director uh, left us back in January. Ken started in February. <clears throat> uh, the health board has done a great job in hiring Dr. Weiss. 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 Uh, she will start uh, the Tuesday after Memorial Day. Ken will be here, I think, through May 29th. So this is Ken's last board of commissioners meeting, uh, at least for now. Uh, uh, unless he has to come for public comment. Maybe I'd come back for public comment. But one of the things we wanted to do is thank you publicly uh, for your leadership. And on behalf of the Wayne County Board of Commissioners, let me read this to you. Uh, in appreciation to Ken Stern, Interim Health Director, Wayne County Department of Public Health, February 2020 through May 2020, for exemplary leadership dedication and tireless efforts in returning to Wayne County as interim health director during unprecedented pan pandemic. Ken's calming strength has been the county's anchor during the storm to come out of retirement into the unknown of COVID-19 and to handle the situation as you did speaks volumes of your character and commitment to Wayne County. Forever thankful and indebted to you and your service to our community. Presented this day, the 19th of May, 2020, by the Wayne County Board of Commissioners. Thank so, you. Kim. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, I know it's been a challenge for me to come back and, and, and face this. And, uh, but I tell you what, the staff at the health department that's doing all the real work and making me look good, those are the ones that really deserve something like this because they, they supported me from day one. They welcomed me back. And I still feel welcome. And, and some of them even say they hate to see me leave. <laughs> I have to come visit when this is all over to come back and get my COVID-19 shot at the health department. <laughs> but thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank, 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 you. You. thank you. Thank you so much. You will buy Um the only other thing I did want to mention to you, and um, I think the biggest issue other than budget that is going to face the county in the next couple of weeks is our courts are going to be opening June 1. So just to let you know that we are meeting with uh, the court system uh, tomorrow and trying to come up with a plan. Uh, one of the things that we have done is gotten some face masks. So we, we're not sure exactly what we may or may not be required to do, uh, but that's the big issue that we're working on right now is opening up the courts and opening up safely uh, June 1. Uh, but if you remember that the states have, have pushed off basically for the last two months, most court, <coughs> excuse me, most court cases. So um, it may be uh, a madhouse around here uh, in the short term. So um, uh, just want to, you know, if, you, if you're out this way and you see people lined up, that's what it's for. So, but, but I, I think we're, we're really working on a plan. I appreciate uh, Justin Minshew, our <coughs> uh, clerk of court and uh, our local judges. And again, hopefully we'll have a plan that we can share with you uh, after tomorrow. And that is all I have this time. Okay. Um, Board of Commissioners, comments? Uh, Mr. Pate. Yes, sir. Cut me off cord. Um, <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. Hey, I really want to give a personal thanks to Ken. He's done a great job. Oh, Larry, he's still in there. Okay. And I... Had, if I'd known this was going to be your, you were going to be here today and it was your last day, I'd have come up with something really tough for you, but it'd be to pick on you. Now, Ken's a great, done a great job for us, and we really appreciate that. 
Oh, we did have a teleconference last week with the hospital, and, and as to what he was saying, you're beginning to see some flattening of the curve, which is a good thing. And, um, of course, the hospital's still pretty closed up. We are doing our, all our meetings about teleconference. I, I hadn't even been in the hospital in about two months. But that's that's a good thing. You've got enough protective equipment, enough ventilators, and that kind of thing. Um, did have a chance to go to the coast this weekend, and you could tell for sure that the public is ready to get out of their house. Took an hour to get over to Bridge de Morale, and uh, the pictures I saw on the, on the beach, they were packed to the max. We never went anywhere else, but... I'm glad things are opening up, and I hope that we'll continue to go in that direction because people simply just cannot sit at home anymore. I can't, and I won't. Thank you. Mr. Camardi? Uh, thank you, sir. We had a DSS meeting yesterday, mm -hmm. teleconference. Mm -hmm. Very successful. Uh, I, I'm not sure we'll ever go back to the old way of deciding you got to ride 45, 50 minutes to get to a meeting when it can so easily be done uh, through teleconference because there's always a value of seeing folk face to face. Ken, I'd like to also add, add my appreciation to uh, the times that I attended meetings at the health department and in your previous role. I always thought you gave a quite sophisticated uh, 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 report uh, and uh, I appreciate that. It, it, it's sort of a, maybe a testament to how well you're doing now as to how well you've always done, I guess. So you, you, people's history sometimes just sort of follows them if you do tend to do a good job. One, in one role, you do a good job in another role. So thank you very much. That's it, Mr. Mr. Daughter. Ken, we'll miss you. <laughs> um, you have done a great job there at the health department under very extraordinary times. Um, and you've not only led the department during that time, but you also helped us in obtaining a, a new director for Wayne County Health Department. Uh, I'm excited about that selection. Um, I think we were fortunate it happened to be the right timing for her and for the county. Uh, she comes to us from uh, Pennsylvania, uh, where she is the health director uh, of a county uh, of about 850,000 population. Um, she's looking forward to getting here. In fact, when she made the comment, when we asked her, when could you start, she said two weeks. Well, we were not, <laughs> we were kind of surprised to hear anyone say two weeks. How in the world can you leave that position and be here in two weeks? Uh, she's that excited about getting out of Pennsylvania, I think. Uh, but she does have family ties in North Carolina. I think she has two daughters that are going to ECU. So she's just basically coming back home. Um, but again, thanks so much for, for the great job. Um, and I think I said enough in regards to the pandemic last time. I had some comments that I went a little overboard, but uh, I'm passionate about that uh, somewhat. But that said, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Worrell? Yeah. I would like to say uh, thank you, Ken, for all the work that uh, you have done. Uh, I've been here a brief time, and I met you twice, so I do appreciate everything that you have done. Also, I would like to thank um, all the volunteers and, and all the uh, workers that ensured that our kids were uh, fed during the uh, pandemic. That was uh, much appreciated. And I, I still want to say I uh, just still use precaution as we uh, go about our day. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Aikai. Thank you. I also want to thank Ken for coming back and getting us out of a bind. Thank you so much. Also, just a couple of things. Uh, North Carolina Department of Insurance has a, uh, a grant program. It's a 50-50 grant for all of our volunteer fire departments. And uh, Wayne County has always been real aggressive in getting these 50-50 grants. Uh, and basically what a 50-50 grant is, uh, if there's some specialized equipment or whatever, 
as far as turnout gear, breathing equipment, any, anything that the fire departments need to or have to have to keep their rating up. Uh, they have to come up with 50% of the money and the Department of Insurance pays the other 50%. And uh, so it's a good way for the department to get some much needed equipment uh, when they only have to pay half price for it. Uh, this year, or uh, last week, the uh, announcement came out which departments in Wayne County got the 50-50 grant this year. We had 15 fire departments out of 24 to receive the grants. Uh, the other ones, I don't, they may not be applied, I don't know. But we did have 15 fire departments to receive 50-50 <coughs> grants. And those grants uh, range from somewhere around $3,000 to other 30000 depending on what the fire departments asked for. And the, uh, the 15 departments, the total 50-50 grant that this Department of Insurance will match was $219,000. So that's, that's, that's speaking highly of our fire departments. Also, I want to uh, thank everyone that was involved yesterday for the graveside service for retired Fire Chief Donald Gray from New Hope Fire Department. Uh, we kind of shot the, the uh, social distancing out the window yesterday, but I mean, when the chips are down, uh, we all come together. I want to thank our EMS department for their participation in looking after Jason, uh, all of the fire departments, uh, most of the fire departments in Wayne County participated, Seymour Johnson, uh, Goldsboro. Uh, and we also had departments uh, in the possession, uh, which I just said, Wayne County, Green County, Duplin County, and I think Lenore County. Uh, but mention Duplin County just a minute. Uh, New York Fire Department had a purchased a ladder truck several years ago. And I think after they had it a few years, they realized maybe they really didn't need a ladder truck. So they sold that truck to uh, the Warsaw Fire Department in, uh, in Duplin County. Warsaw brought that truck back home to them for two days. Uh, and I, that speaks highly of our neighbors in other counties. And uh, Mr. Gray was the son of a former county commissioner, mm -hmm. Mr. Bud Gray. All of us knew him as Uncle Bud. Uh, fine family. What that family has contributed to the volunteer service and the uh, EMS fire service, all of them combined to send that family, their total years comes over 300 years if you add them all together. And uh, they were, they're, they're an exceptional family, and, and we got plenty of families like that in Wayne County, but I just want to thank everyone that, was, that participated in that yesterday. The county, thank y'all for what y'all did. Uh, The older I get, the harder these things are to attend. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, thank you, everyone that was involved. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Lake. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Before Kumar. you do your comments, I, 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 I would just like to thank uh, Mr. Cutterback and Mr. Stryker for the leadership that you all are providing. Uh, I, I, I think it's just pure civilians that you're at home, you, you hear the sirens going and you always wonder where they're going to and you shudder just a little bit and they quieten down and you hope that everybody's okay. Uh, I think probably when you get a little older you become a lot more aware of, of how quickly things can change in one's life but uh, uh, as the hurricane season is approaching and all the other things that happen to us on a daily basis. Uh, I, I, I think Wayne County residents, I do, feel pretty safe in that we can't figure what's going to happen to us, but we always sort of feel like that, you know, maybe somebody is out there to do a little rescue and help us when they can. It's, it's, uh, it's just refreshing to know that we've we got a good uh, organization going, Mr. County Manager. And so it's important, Mr. S uh, Ken retiring. And, but uh, like Joe said, I, I'm sure that lady's coming down here wanting to come to Wayne County to do a good job, probably to enjoy the weather. It's just a little bit better than it is. And, you know, I'm sure that's probably what it is. That might be the reason she's 
you know, want to get on, get in place. But uh, I've lived in Philadelphia a couple of times, and it's a nice place to live, but the weather can get a little raw up there. So that's a good enough reason for wanting to make it back to North Carolina. But thank, just thank all of the uh, first responders, as Mr. Acock likes to call you, all of you, and maybe not in one big basket, but we're fortunate, and, uh, and we appreciate that. Okay. <clears throat> I, I just have a few. I want to just <clears throat> say, Ken, thank you so much for uh, your service in the health department. It's been a few years since I've been on your board, but I, I remember the, the the quality, and you're right, of the staff and everybody that said the health department. Uh, you're to be commended because uh, good support people start out at the top with a good manager. And you have you have done that, so thank you, uh, Commissioner Acock. I agree with you. The older we get, the harder it is to lose our friends and our families uh, that that we know. I think one thing that has possibly come out of this uh, death of Donald Gray is the fact that the the legislature and others, our law enforcement, but our legislatures and our lawmakers are keenly aware that in North Carolina, we need to have some special leg legislation for farm equipment on the road. We have, we have none. Some states have that if you uh, do not yield to a piece of farm equipment, that you are written, a, you are given a written citation, just as if you were speeding or running a stop sign. Uh, I understand that this was sort of a freak accident that happened, but yes, it did happen. So maybe somewhere along the way, we can get some stricter laws when it comes to farm equipment on the road. As you know, uh, farm equipment now is. 15 times wider than the old one one row farm mall that we used to farm with. And these, when these things go down the road, they take up the whole road. So uh, also, um, we, 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 we're in a lot of uh, meetings or webinars, the county manager and I, we, we still have the Wayne County Business Support Group from Wayne Community College, uh, Craig Font that is heading that up. We have that every Thursday, and and the information that's coming out of that is is just it's just invaluable to small business. My, my myself, as far as the PPP program and all these things, the small business, it's really been a tremendous help to to me, uh, being involved in that. But the Wayne County Development Alliance that that I'm now on the board, man, I'm telling you, the Wayne County Development Alliance still has a lot going on. Uh, it's it's amazing that this interest is still there for industry to move in. And of course, that has to do with uh, our WCDA director and the staff and everybody that's concerned. I think we have a really good advertising. I think we have what we need, but the key is the words out there. You can you can find us across the world as to what's available for industry. Our DSS, as Commissioner Marty, Marty mentioned, uh, we did have our teleconference meeting yesterday. We may be setting a new precedence, Mr. Camardi, uh, but <clears throat> went really well. I can tell you this, the DSS is in better shape now, I'm talking about from top to bottom, than I can remember in the six years I've been on the DSS board. We still have some things to do, and there always will be. But I'm telling you, uh, the progress the progress that DSS in meeting the mandates of the state and all the standards that they put on us, uh, it, it, it's just tremendous as to how that has all turned around. So I have to give it, I have to give a lot of the credit, as Mr. Parker does, to our DSS director, she 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 does a, a fantastic job and is doing a fantastic job. 
Um, that's all I have at this time. Uh, I think we need to go back in the closed session, Mr. Parker. Okay. Motion to go into closed session? So moved. Okay. All raise your right hand, please. <laughs> okay. It's close. Yep. Okay. Uh, welcome back uh, from our uh, recess. Uh, we're reconvening our uh, budget work session at this time. And uh, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Honeycutt at this point. Uh, uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have Ted Lord here at, with um, Davenport and Company, and this is really kind of an, our annual look, and it's a good opportunity, especially right before we get into a lot of budget discussion to see where we're at, what our policies are, where we're going, and what commitments we have. Uh, Ted and, and Mitch have done a wonderful job for us over the years, and we appreciate Ted being here. and. We also appreciate uh, Ted being a big fan of McCall's. So, um, uh, but with that said, Allison, did you want to? Um, just, I'll, I'll turn it over to Ted. Okay. He's, they've Great. got it all ready to go. All right. all right, wonderful. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've got a presentation. I think we're all looking at the exact same thing on our screens. If you have a hard copy, that's the same as well. Um, there are page numbers in the lower right corner. Um, and I'm going to be. You can you can flip. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I and certainly would like if there are questions along the way, please um, stop me and I'll explain what we're uh, what the topic is or try to address the questions as we go. So <clears throat> we've got a table of contents and hopefully each of you will have a hard copy of this. A number of things in the appendix that we do not plan to go through. They're really support information. Um, but we're going to sort of talk through um, a little bit about bond ratings, a talk about fund balance and financial performance. Um, we're going to give you a good overview of your existing debt profile and your debt obligations. And then we're going to talk about capital projects going forward. Um, we've basically listed those out for you on page two. So again, the topics for discussion that we plan to cover as we go. First, I want to talk about bond ratings. Um, on the left-hand side, you're going to see a chart, and um, those are the rating agency bond rating categories. So Moody's, uh, Investor Service, Standard & Poor's, and Fitch, those are the three national rating agencies that are most commonly used. AAA is the highest bond rating any local government can achieve, and what you all will see there in gold is that is that you all are rated AA2 by Moody's and AA by S&P. So you're a couple notches away from the highest rating possible, again, that being AAA. Um, in the upper left, you'll see that both Moody's and S&P have rated the county um, fairly recently. 2017 was the last bond issue that they rated. Moody's does publish uh, information every year, so they have a report that was published in the fall of 19. But even though S&P has not published a report since 17, that is still a current rating. So you have a very solid rating in the AA category. And on the right-hand side, we're introducing um, some peer comparatives. We, we subscribe to a database that Moody's maintains. And so we're going to look at, in a couple of slides, how you compare to counties across the country or nationally that are AAA rated, rated at AA1, or rated AA2, which is what you all are rated. So we've looked at your rating category plus the two categories right above you, where over time we'd like to see the county's rating evolve. <coughs> Nationally, there are 257 AA2 counties, one of which is Wayne County. Within North Carolina, you can see the AAA counties. There are nine. Uh, there are 13 AA1 counties, and there are 21 AA2 counties, again, one of which is Wayne. So you can see who your peers are from a rating, um, from a rating standpoint and, and also the credits or the counties that are rated one or two notches above you all. Okay? Any questions there? Didn't we used to be a AAA? County. Um, I, 
I think there there may have been a bond issue that you had outstanding that was rated AAA, but it was rated AAA because it had bond insurance on it. So I think you've always been that double A category. Okay. Okay. You have not gone backwards in your rating over any of your history that we're aware of. You've only either established it or moved to a, a higher level. Okay. Okay. Um, a little bit of overview on how the rating agencies look at rating local governments. Moody's is on the left. You can see at very high categories, the economy is worth 30% of the rating. And we've put check boxes next to those as either being things that you can control in the short term or the long term. And so economy, when we're talking about jobs, we're talking about um, median family income, we're talking about your tax base on a per person basis. Those aren't things that you can control in a short period of time. They're more of a longer term evolution. So that's why that's a long term control check there. Finances are worth 30% of the rating. So we're talking about things like fund balance and your fund balance trends. Um, there's control over that in the shorter term, right? Budget to budget, year by year that you all can establish um, financial um, benchmarks or you know either grow fund balance or use fund balance depending on the need and it's also a long-term um, factor management we're getting into policies procedures planning things of that nature is worth 20 percent of the rating and debt and pension obligations are worth 20 percent s p on the right gets to about the same place economy is 30 percent of the rating um, finances, whether it's budget flexibility, budget performance, or liquidity is about 30%, and the remainder of the rating approach is, um, relates to debt and management, okay? So talk a little bit about your financial performance, and this is on page seven. The upper left chart is looking at audited financials, fiscal year 14 through 19. The gold line, is tracking operating revenues, and then the bars represent operating expenses, whether it's operations, debt service, or capital. Operations in dark green, debt service in brown, and capital and other expenditures in the lighter green. And what you're gonna see is over time, particularly in recent years, um, you know, your revenues are outperforming your operating costs and your debt service, but some years you're spending on capital um, more than what revenues are coming in, which is, is certainly fine. There's no, there's no problem with that. Um, but what it also means when you look at the bottom chart is we've seen some fund balance levels coming down. Not because you're funding operations, but because you're choosing to use some reserves for capital, and again, that's not a negative, it's just trying to establish a baseline discussion on fund balance trends. And when you look at the chart on the right-hand side, what you're going to see is a very impressive, in, in my opinion, having worked with a number of other local governments, list of pay-as-you-go capital projects that the county has undertaken over the years between fiscal year 15 and 19 about $39 million worth of projects that have been funded through pay-as-you-go sources, whether it's current year revenues or fund balance, eff effectively avoiding the issuance of debt um, by funding those with cash. Now, we also know you've had to issue some debt for other projects, and we've listed those in the bottom right, particularly in 2014 for schools, about $38 million. And in 2017, for school and county projects, about 35 million. So, you know, over the last five, six years, we're talking about um, almost $120 million worth of capital that has invested, 40 million of which was done through, um, for, through cash sources, pay as you go, and another, another roughly 80 million through debt. Um, and so when we talk about fund balance trends, Okay. What you'll see on this next page, which is page eight, is in that upper left chart, your total fund balance in the light green or your unassigned fund balance in the dark green over this period of time have come down. 
Again, they are still at a level that is above your policy. You all have an established policy that says your fund balance will be at least 14% of your general fund expenditures, and you have been able to do that in all of these years. But we've noticed that that line is coming down closer to the policy level. And that, you know, we, we've known that because we've known <laughs> year by year how you're funding capital. Um, and what I think it also means is as we go forward and start talking about additional capital needs, the use of reserves will be a little bit more limited because you're getting closer and closer to your policy. Okay, so that's just something to be mindful of because here in a moment we're going to talk about potential new projects and how do we fund them. And that's not to say you won't continue doing pay-as-you-go funding. There just not, may not be quite as much reserves available for that purpose above your policy limit. What I will also tell you on the right-hand side is the comparisons. Um, this is where we're pulling in that database from Moody's. And when you look at that upper right chart, we're looking at your total fund balance. They look at it as a percent of revenues. You're in the gold. Wayne County fiscal 19 is in the gold. You want your bar further to the right here. And the national counties, um, AAA, AA1, AA2 are in light green, and the North Carolina counties are in the dark green. And you match up very nicely to those medians. You may not be the highest within the entire universe, but you are right on the median for each of those different rating levels, whether it's nationally or within North Carolina. That's for total fund balance. The bottom chart, same basic concept, but we're graphing unassigned fund balance, which is a component of your fund balance. It's the component that has the least amount of restrictions. And you're a little bit below the median for the national counties, but you are pretty well in line with the AAA and AA1 <coughs> counties in North Carolina. So um, a tad below those medians, but I think still at a very reasonable level. So. We know you're in compliance with your policy, you have a good policy, um, and your fund balance levels at the close of fiscal 19 are at a level commensurate with your rating category and the rating categories above you, whether you're looking at it with just North Carolina counties or nationally. Okay? Any questions? All right, so we'll talk about debt for a moment. Page 10. Um, on the left-hand side, we've tied out to the, the last audit, June of 19, total debt outstanding of about $73 million. You can see graphically up at the top on a fiscal year basis, and we've actually gone back to 2014, so the gray bars are the historical debt service by fiscal year. 14 through 19, and during that period of time, as, we, as I mentioned earlier, you were issuing debt for capital projects, and your annual debt service was going up, right? Investing in schools, investing in county facilities, year by year in the gray there, your annual debt service were going up, and it peaked out at, at about $10 million a year. The, the green bars are showing what the debt service will be going forward. Uh, the dark green part is, princi is principal, excuse me, is the county debt, and the light green color is school debt. So we've broken that out. Of the $73 million of debt that you all have outstanding today, about $17 million is for county purposes or non-school purposes, and the balance, about $56 million is for school purposes. But debt service is stepping down year by year, some years more than others, and we're we're pretty nicely below that peak year of 10 million that you had in fiscal year 19. All of your debt is fixed rate. We know exactly what the payments are every year. It's only going to change if you all choose to change it. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see by fiscal year the principal payments, the interest, total payments. The year we're in, in fiscal 20, total payments were about eight and a half million, and it's stepping down year by year as we go forward. The far right column says 10-year payout ratio. That is a measurement of how quickly you're amortizing your debt. It's a forward-looking 10-year horizon that says 
10 years from now, how much of that principal will have been retired. And with your debt structure, about 65% of it will be paid back in the next 10 years. Um, higher is better. You'll see here in a moment you have a policy about that. Um, and then the bottom, very bottom, we just wanted to make note that um, fiscal 20 and beyond, there are essentially four loans that are outstanding. A 2011 installment with bb and a 2014 installment with SunTrust, and then two bond issues that I mentioned earlier, the 2017 and a 2017 USDA loan. Um, we will continue to monitor those with your staff, looking at what the prepayment terms and conditions are for each of those loans, what the interest rates are for each of those loans, and where there is an opportunity to refund those for savings. Um, you know, we'll certainly um, we'll, we'll bring those to y'all's attention so you have an opportunity to assess it and, and make some decisions. Some of these are currently prepayable, some are not. Those were terms and conditions that were entered into when we closed the loan. Um, and some of them have higher interest rates, but they might have a federal subsidy associated with them. So there might be a higher interest rate, but you're also getting a subsidy for a portion of the interest, so it brings the net cost of the borrowing down and, and oftentimes down below current market rates. But we, we have been looking at these over the years, trying to make sure we're in a position to take advantage of refundings, and, and we will continue to do that. Even Any? where one of the evidently limited obligation bonds is at 5%? Yes, sir. So there are, there are a range of coupons on that loan from 3 to 5%. Now, at the time, it, get, it can get fairly complex with a concept called original issue premium. But at the time, um, the coupon might have been set at 5%, but you were getting paid more than 100 cents on the dollar for the bond. So you're, to, to borrow an even 20 million, you might have only needed to issue about 18 million. That's a function of the bond market. That's not unique to Wayne County. But the long and short of it is that bond um, was sold absolutely at, at market rates in 17, and it's not prepayable, meaning we can't take it away from the current bondholders until 2027. So we'll continue to monitor it. There may be an opportunity um, to do what we call an advance refunding. IRS regulations have changed on that in recent years. But I know that the coupon, particularly the 5% coupon, can be a little bit deceiving. Um, your cost of borrowing on that, I think, was in the in the 3% range, even though you had some coupons that were higher than that. And is it my understanding <clears throat> or my memory that the Q-scab, or what would you call it? Q-scab, that's okay. exactly right. Yes, okay. sir. That particular loan uh, was on school facilities. Correct. And the interest is rebated back to us? Correct. Is that correct? Except when, the, except when they don't have a budget federal, and then you have to pay, but you don't get it back. Well, let me hear that again. <laughs> and they didn't have a budget, the federal budget? Right. They didn't give it back. Well, they have, they, have tr they have cut the subsidy back a few times through what they call sequestration. Um, but I, I think at the end of the day, they, I don't think they've missed an entire reimbursement um, of, of interest. But we are getting most of that back. Yes. Okay. And, and you're, you're exactly right. Qualified school construction bonds, normally you all would issue bonds on a tax-exempt basis for schools and county purposes. This was a program through the Stimulus Act um, that actually required you to issue taxable bonds, not tax exempt, but taxable, so higher interest rate, but you were getting a federal subsidy on the back end. And so when you net that all out, it's, it's, a, it's an effective borrowing tool, even though they have trimmed back the federal subsidy a little bit, they have taken it, they have started to restore it, it's still not at 100%. Uh, but it's still a better debt obligation um, than 
you know, what you could do today on a tax exempt basis because it's a pretty significant subsidy. And, and one other interesting thing I'm seeing here, and that is uh, back on page seven, you listed the projects, county projects, uh, that we completed that we paid cash for in the amount of about $39 million. Correct. Uh, and if you compare the county debt for county facilities and so forth, and add our 39 million, it almost balances out to what the entire debt is for schools, both of those in the 55, 56 million range. We just decided to go ahead and, and spend our cash reserves rather than borrowing to do our $56 million worth of improvements. That's right. And there are, in that page seven, there are a few school projects in there as oh, well that were cash okay. funded. So it's a, a little bit of a mix. Okay, there are some. Okay. Um, there were some reserves that had been accumulated for school purposes, and I think you all had reallocated some reserves so that... Middle lane um, classrooms, some, uh, yeah, I see correct. them there. Okay. All right, good enough. Okay. But, yeah, certainly all of those that were cash funded could have been debt funded. They would have been eligible for debt funding. But again, the reserves had been accumulated. The planning had been done where you all could um, fund a good chunk of these needs with, with pay-as-you-go versus debt. Um, so back to page 10. That's your debt profile. We have seen the annual debt service budget go to a, a high in fiscal 19 of about 10 million. It's now on the downslope. Um, and again, a fairly limited number of bond issues outstanding that we'll, we'll continue to monitor with your staff to make sure that if there are refunding opportunities, we're on top of those. Um, a couple of quick slides beginning on 11 related to your debt policies and certain key debt ratios. This page 11 is, is measuring that 10-year payout ratio that I mentioned earlier, the pace with which you're paying down principal. The green bars in the upper left are your payout ratio, 65%, and you see it's getting stronger. You all have a policy in place that says we don't want that to fall below 50%. So you want to be above that yellow or, excuse me, that red line, and you are um, by about, you know, 15%. Um, and on a comparison basis in the upper right, comparing you against those same six categories of nationally rated counties and North Carolina rated counties, you want that gold bar further to the right. So you're a, a bit below the medians, but you're certainly not an outlier. You can see there are highly rated North Carolina counties that have a 10-year 10 10 year payout ratio below 60%, in some cases even below 30 or 40%. Okay, so you're in compliance with your policy and you are managing that well compared to your, your rated peers. Page 12, another policy you have, which is debt to assess value. So the amount of debt outstanding as a percent of the tax base. Um, we're using a, just under about 9 billion, 8.9 billion of assessed value. We're growing that at about one and a quarter percent. And so when we take your debt outstanding and do the math, your, um, your debt to assess value is right at about, a little hand covered it, sorry, 0.8%. Um, your policy says we want that to be below 2%. So you're well below that policy. Um, and you would have capacity within that policy. In other words, there is some amount of new debt you could choose to take on and still demonstrate that you are below your policy. That does not mean it's affordable. It doesn't mean you should do it. The capacity is there. The question of affordability is what we're going to answer here in a moment. On the comparison in the upper right, you'll see, um, I'm going to go back to the national counties in light green in a minute. The dark green bars, lower is better. You want your bar further to the left, and you match up nicely to those medians. You are below the medians for all of those dark green North Carolina peers. And you can see there are highly rated counties in North Carolina whose ratio is above 1 or even 2%. So you compare favorably um, to your rated peers. The national counties, you get a little bit of... Um, 
difficulty in comparison because you go to a number of other states and there are independent school districts that have taxing authority and debt issuance authority. So in those, in those states, counties don't carry school debt. Uh, you go to South Carolina as an example, they have independent school districts. So the counties there, their debt profile does not carry um, the, the school debt. That's why those light green bars are so much further to the left. Within the Moody's uh, rating categories, you, you rank as strong double A for the level of debt to assess value that you have. So again, uh, in good shape there. And then finally, debt service versus governmental expenditures. So we're, we're measuring here essentially how much of your annual budget is going to debt service. Remember I said your debt service was at about $10 million in the peak and it's starting to step down. When we do the math in, in accordance with how the rating agencies do it, um, you're coming up with a debt service to expenditures of about seven, a little over seven and a half percent, and it's declining over time. You have a policy that says you don't want that to go above 12 percent, so you're below that policy, which is good. You have some capacity, and on the comparison in the upper right, lower is better here. You compare very well to the national uh, counties, and you're below the North Carolina counties, which in this case is a positive lower is better. And for S&P, you rank in their very strong category. So I think the takeaway on all of this debt is you've managed debt, I think, prudently. Um, you've found a good mix between pay-as-you-go and debt. You have good debt policies. You're in compliance with all of those policies. And you have capacity to take on some additional debt if you decide that's something you want to do for capital. Do, that doesn't necessarily mean it's affordable, but the capacity is there within your debt profile to be having those conversations. And so I want to talk about affordability and, and county capital improvement plan is the next section. Um, this is the latest iteration of the CIP or the improvement plan. It's going to cover fiscal years 21 through 25. I think it's fair to say that's an evolving discussion. And as things move forward with your budget process, you'll be able to fine tune that. So I wouldn't, we're happy to talk about the CIP and the details of it, but I have a, a, a sense that that's going to be something you're gonna dig into at some point moving forward. So you'll see a current version here in a moment. 15, and you might need to look at your hard copy, I do. Um, this is an important page, and just bear with me as we go through it, because this is what gets to the affordability of the debt. Um, and if you look from left to right, we have everything on a fiscal year basis, starting with fiscal year 21, which is the budget you're working on. The first column, column B, is the existing debt service for county projects, okay? The schools, do not run through this. The school's capital is funded in accordance with the school funding agreement. So what we're focusing on here today is the county capital um, and debt model. So column B is in boy is showing the debt service for the county debt obligations that are outstanding fiscal 21 through 37. Columns C through G are placeholders. Nothing in there. We're going to fill those in here in a moment after we talk about the capital projects. So H, column H is just restating column B. The middle of the page is identifying the sources of funding that are, you all are budgeting to pay that county debt service. So it's essentially mirroring your county debt budgeting practices. And the lion's share of that money is under column I. Um, that is a appropriation from current year revenues of about a million seven eighty five, and we have held that flat going forward. We've assumed that you could continue to budget that same amount every year going forward, but that obviously will happen year by year with your budget. Columns J, uh, that's a little bit of re. re reimbursement or payment you all are getting on some eastern region loans that you have made to some of the um, localities. Um, column M is in Michael, the proceeds from a private donor, private donor campaign related to the Maxwell Center. And then column N is in Nancy, are assessment revenues tied to some street 
uh, programs that you've done in certain neighborhoods. So you've got, a, you've got some dollars coming in from a few places, the lion's share of which is um, the current appropriation from, um, from the general fund. So column P as in Paul is where those all get added up. And then what we're doing mm -hmm. is we're, care, we're comparing the, the payments due under H, which we know to the penny. We know exactly what those payments are every year and the revenues that we've identified in column P. And we compare those in column O as in Oscar. And you'll see that you have more dollars identified for county debt service than the payments, right? So you are, you, you've got a net surplus in this, or I guess it's actually column Q, not O, sorry. Um, so you have actually have annual surpluses in the county debt model, okay? Remember, schools are not pulled into this. And a couple of takeaways that I believe that means is one, your current county debt profile is paid for in a sustainable fashion. The key to that is that you can continue to budget the million seven eighty-five every year. And if you were to do that and create those surpluses, you all have some affordability to take on some additional projects, whether it's pay-as-you-go projects or debt-funded projects, okay? And, and so this is where we're getting to the discussion about the affordability of additional capital needs on the county side. And right now, we're accumulating those revenues way over in the right under column V. You've actually got about 2.9, call it $3 million of accumulated reserves over there. Those are reserves, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Allison, those are reserves over and above the fund balance numbers that we talked about earlier, right? So you've been using some fund balance. You're still above your policy, but you've been using some fund balance. You and a capital reserve have about $3 million that you've accumulated and set aside for capital projects that you have um, that you're able to consider going forward as needed for, for your CIP. So you've got, a, you've got some money set aside already, and right now our model is just pulling over those annual surpluses and accumulating, accumulating them in column V. What we're about to evolve to is talking about potential projects, and we're going to start to fill in columns C through G over here to see how all of that balances out in the future. Any questions on that? I do, but I'm going to hold until you get to the next page because I'm not quite understanding why this model would actually automatically create surpluses. In other words, why would you budget $1,785,000 when you could actually budget one two eighty five? and have zero in regards to surplus. And that, absolutely, and I think that's something you all will look at year by year, budget by budget, with whatever stresses you're having in other parts of your budget. If that is an area where you want to trim it back, you're able to do that. That was the dollar amount that you budgeted in FY20. So we've held it flat. Sure. And, and um, I think it's just a working assumption right now that you may choose to do something differently as you get into but this working model would actually produce additional surpluses to where in 2041 there's going to be 22 million in surplus cap if you do nothing else on capital which we're oh, about oh great. about to um, fill in some of those and I think that's what you were alluding to okay, earlier yeah let's go to that so one. we're kind of building it bit by bit but I absolutely um, Hear you loud and clear. Um, I was gonna say I, max, I magnified it a little bit, Ted, so you have to scroll more. Okay. Okay. So, draft CIP summary, fiscal years twenty. Am I moving what's on your screen when mm -hmm. I do? Okay. Yep, yep, yep. I'm, we're, we've got fiscal year twenty-one through twenty-five. Um, the top eight lines are the general categories of uses of funds. So you have general fund departments, school funding agreement, vehicles, and IT. And we have some detail that we'll look at in a moment, and certainly in the back of the book, that will allow you to understand what's in each of those four broad categories. Um, but in total, fiscal 21 through 25, it's about in that 
over in the right, uh, $37.8 million worth of projects have been identified preliminarily in this CIP version, okay? The bottom of the page is showing where the sources of funds could come from, whether it's departmental funding, uh, state funding for DSS, dollars that have been agreed to and identified in the school funding agreement, debt issuance, and pay as you go or fund balance. So what you'll notice is year by year, lines eight and 17 should match. The uses of funds and the sources of funds should match every year, and they match in the aggregate 37.8 million. Keep in mind, solid waste is not in here. There's a couple of other um, footnotes there at the bottom. And uh, I think if we go, maybe I'll let you drive it, Sure, Allison. If we go to the next page, you're going to start to get into some additional detail about each of those four broad categories. So um, I'm on page 17. You can see we've got the county general fund departments, which go all the way down to line 23. That's the 31.6 million. Okay, that's the lion's share of what makes this up. And then we have details surrounding, that includes the schools, then we have details surrounding sheriff, EMS, general government um, vehicles there. You can see that subtotal on line 29 and then the IT subtotal on line 34. So I don't know if there's any questions on that. Again, I think these are projects and categories that y'all will continue to discuss and evolve on, but this is what we're starting with when we talk about the capital program going forward. And, and an assumption we made in this year's CIP moving forward was we were funding it at the same level as we did last year. So in just making adjustments within that. So just a quick question, the two point six million on emergency management. So it does not include the new nine one one call center. Correct. So what is that including? That is the um that's the towers. Yeah, that's that's the towers and radios, radios that you're gonna finance. That, that we're gonna finance. So they've just brought those forward because we're financing. I mean you'll see that I think in some other right. schedules that he's got. Yeah, those were the projects we approved last year, but we just did not do the uh, debt financing yet. Okay. And I think over the years, as this process has evolved, I think it's fair to say it was oftentimes, if something wasn't approved for funding in year one, it was usually moved out a year mm -hmm. to year two. And so sometimes you see that as a holdover, that you've got a year that's kind of heavy or larger, and it's just because generally if something's not ready to be funded in year one, it goes to year two, and I think things will evolve on that, ideally to where you're putting projects in years where either they're absolutely needed or they fit some other prioritization process to land in that year. So when we get into our budget discussions, we're gonna go through some of this. Right, and, and what, okay. what you'll see is, is we've got listed I've got listed all capital, and but all, not the the um, radios, but all capital at the 1.7 million. I'm still recommending that we keep capital in this year because when we start delaying and putting things off, we're only getting in trouble and getting further behind. But we're going to talk about these individuals. Yes. Later. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Good enough. Okay. All right, so we'll go to page 18. Um, what we've got here is the, a little more detail on the sources of funding. So um, what we're calling the other sources is subtotaled on line eight. Uh, a good chunk of that is the school funding agreement, $2 million a year. Um, we do have some debt built into this CIP on lines 10 through 14. We've done... Um, short-term debt for five years or seven years and some longer-term debt on 15 years. We basically looked at the projects that are on the list now and kind of discussing with staff on the expected useful life of the asset, an appropriate term over which to finance it. So we've, um, we've got some projects that are be 
are being debt funded over five, seven, or 15 years. In total, line 14, it's about $18 million. Now, it's not all done at one time. It's spaced out over time as the projects um, are, are scheduled. And again, I think the expectation would be that this would get revisited year by year as you're working through your budget process and prioritizing projects and determining um, you know, your appetite and ability to take on additional projects, whether it's cash funded or debt funded. And then finally, at the bottom, we've got um, pay-go funding, whether it's reoccurring um, built into the budget, it's a level of about a million two a year, or whether it's the potential use of um, one-time reserves. Okay? So if you take that at face value, knowing that you're going to be revisiting that CIP and digging into it, what we've got on page 19 is just showing the debt portion of the CIP as I just discussed it. So we are talking about five, seven, 15 year debt amortizations. If you look in the bottom right, you'll see it says par amount by fiscal year, that's the borrowing amount. Approximately 11 million in fiscal 21, the year you're about to go into, a million in 23, and 6 million in 2025. In total, a little over 18 million. Um, and you would fund that year by year. So you're not, you know, you're not signing off on all of this at one time. It's just for projection purposes, this is what we're doing, and we're taking that amount of debt. Remember, it's just call it county debt. No school projects are flowing through this, just county projects, and we're layering that $18 million of debt onto your debt profile in that chart in the upper left. Remember, your payments were a little over $8 million and they were stepping down. Well, when we start layering in this $18 million, we're going to see that debt profile steps up a little bit, which is going to get to that affordability discussion um, here in just a moment. If you go to page 20, we have revisited the debt policies. So if you were to do that capital program and include the debt that we've identified, how would it impact your policies? And so you look across the top and the upper left, you continue to be above that yep, orange line on the 10-year payout. Above is good in that case. So you have not you have no problem with that policy, nor do you have a problem with debt to assess value in the middle. You're below your policy of 2% and debt service to expenditures. You're below your policy of 12%. So you can sort of set to the side, I think, can we do this within the confines of our policies or our rating category, our capacity? I think the answer is yes. And that doesn't mean you should do it, but that part of it, I think, we're very comfortable saying that is an order of magnitude of projects and debt that should work fine with your policies and your bond rating. Affordability is what we've addressed on page 21. So we have gone back and re, uh, revisited that whole chart, okay? And so we have filled in a number of those columns. Remember, all we had on the far left was column B as in boy. That was the existing county debt service. Well, in C, we added in the, the debt service, the potential new debt service if you were to issue that 18 million over that five year period. Column C is what that debt service would be under our assumptions, and that's a blend. Some of it was five year debt, some was seven, some was 15. We have some one time under column D, one time PAYGO capital that was identified in the CIP. Column um, E is annual CIP PAYGO of 750. F is vehicle PAYGO of 975. And G is IT maintenance PAYGO of 250. So we've populated a bunch of these columns and therefore column H now is a more comprehensive number, right? Um, you can see that that is stepping up from 21 to 22 from about 3.6 million to 5.1 million, and then it gets a little bit higher out in a few years. So column H becomes, under this approach to the CIP, just taking it at face value, those are the payments that would be needed to support that CIP, whether it's PAYGO or debt. Um, 
We have kept column I the same, the budget, $1,785,000 from general fund appropriation. J is the same. <clears throat> K, we've, we've included for receipts from volunteer fire department. That's associated with some of the projects that we funded in the CIP. Um, L is monies that you all have available um, to pay for the, uh, the county CIP PAYGO, $1,225,000. Um, and that's the rest of those columns are the same. So what we've now done is we've added a couple of those revenue sources that show up in column P as in Paul. So now what we're doing is measuring H against P. H are the payments that would be needed. P are the sources of funding that we've identified and we compare those in column Q. And we go from what had been annual surpluses of around $500,000 a year to some deficits, right? The, the current funding that had been identified um, it's not that it's insignificant, it's obviously significant, but there's additional resources that would be needed to fund the CIP in this manner. And what you're gonna see as we go through the far right-hand side of this page is under column V as in Victor, we have spent down those accumulated reserves over about three years, and it's out in fiscal year 23 and beyond where we have measured under column U the equivalent penny impact to support the debt or the CIP. So essentially what we're saying is in fiscal year 23, you would need about a penny, just under a penny's worth of revenue to supplement your debt budget to fund this CIP. And the next year you'd need another 1 the equivalent of another 1.2 pennies a couple years later, a fraction of a penny. So over about a um, four-year period, keeping in mind that it doesn't start until 2023, you need a, just under two and a half pennies worth of revenue to support this CIP. Or you could look to you know, establish the funding for that earlier, which would mean you could minimize it a little bit. A penny on y'all's tax rate is generating about $860,000. That's on the lower left. So that gives you just a, a sense of the affordability of this CIP, right? We've discussed the capacity. The capacity is there within your policies and your, your rating category or debt profile. The affordability is something in the range of about two, two and a half pennies over the next several years that you would need to identify from other sources or find within your budget to support this capital program. And I just want to note that doesn't include any operating costs. This is just capital, right? And it doesn't include any school capital because we've addressed that in a separate model consistent with the school funding agreement. We stop there if there are any questions. <clears throat> I do see that in this year you've got one time pay as you go um, of five hundred and twelve thousand on that top line. So we're going to actually budget in there one time pay as you go five hundred and twelve. Is that correct? Yeah, that is in, the, in addition to taking out of capital reserves 249. If all of this got funded exactly in that wet manner, yeah. yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So that's the county picture. We wanted to address the model that we've developed with staff on the school funding agreement. Um, it's set up in a similar fashion on page 23, but it has you know, a whole entire different set of, of revenues and expenses running through it. So just let me get you oriented to this again, starting on the left by fiscal year. And this one starts in fiscal year 20, the year we're finishing. Column B as in boy is school-related debt service that's already on the books. We know that to the penny. We have no new debt running through this model, nothing new, just existing. And part of the school funding agreement is under column D of $2 million a year for pay as you go. So there is existing school debt service under B, 
Pago under D, and they are summed up together under column F. The funding for this is coming from G through K. Restricted sales tax, that is growing. 0% um, growth in the first year, and then 3% per year beyond that. This was a preliminary discussion with staff sort of in light of what's going on in the economy. That will be revisited, I think, and it, it's going to be what it is. Lottery reserves, uh, excuse me, lottery distributions under column H. Um, <coughs> again, you can see that those have been trimmed back a little bit and then go um, with, with no growth fiscal years 21 and beyond. Edgewood Community School savings under column I, those don't begin until fiscal year 22 at about 527,000. And then the QSCAB subsidy on that debt that we mentioned earlier under column J. So what you'll see is G, H, I, and J represent the sources of funding that would be enumerated, detailed in the school funding agreement. K is actually a we're solving for K. There's a little bit of a shortfall, tune of about $43,000 out in fiscal year 21, or the year you're getting ready to, uh, to deal with budget. Um, what you'll notice under column M, though, is we got, we got a couple of years of deficits, but we also have some reserves accumulated way over in column R. So under the school funding agreement, as we understand it today, we've got some reserves. We will likely need to use those reserves in the current year as well as fiscal year 21. Maybe a little bit of a shortfall in 21 of about 43,000. <clears> but then at that point, this is a self-sustaining model for the existing debt and pay go. Nothing new is running through here yet. Okay. Add? I just wanted to add in column R where you were talking about the school sales tax reserves, that this reserve is separate from that original four point six million that that we've been using to pay for Southern Wayne and, and set aside for that project. So that is not included in here because we considered that to be kind of set aside for something else. <clears throat> You were reading my mind. <laughs> <laughs> and out of that 4.6, we've already allocated some of that for the gymnasium, right? That's right. I think there's about a million and a half left, right. if I remember correctly. 365 also for the land. Well, well, a couple of questions here. First question is, why have you not designated any dollars for the Edgewood Community School Savings for two years, 20 and 21. So um, that that was at, at my direction last year, whenever we, um, I think we decided to give them that two year bridge orig originally to get them through whatever decisions they were gonna make about Edgewood. And so that was the, that was the last I communicated with them until something more permanent was decided. Uh, and secondly, <laughs> We're not going to have that 527, or are we? No. Well, you would we, after we have commit, we, <laughs> we've now committed a half million dollars of that this year that we're looking at. Then after that, you would have it up to the board. That you know, since really that no, we're, we're ending it. <laughs> we're ending, we're ending this it. Thing. Well, and yes. In fact, we're not going to even refer to Edgewood again in any of these documents. <laughs> so we will re we will label this something else. Um, but if if we do what we what was discussed, what we've talked about, which is maybe doing a one time <laughs> capital instead of this, and then from here on out, we would have this savings. It would still be, be built into this debt repayment plan, and we can call it something else. Just call it something else. We will. Okay. <laughs> okay. In light of that, does page 24 relevant still? To um, you can show it to them. I did. I, I asked um, Ted to. Oh, well, can I go back to 23? Okay. We'll make sure we all are on the same page here. Basically, all of the financing for school debt that's outstanding is paid for from the following things. From restricted sales tax that goes to schools, one. Two, from lottery proceeds. 
three from school savings, the 527, and number four was the subsidy. Correct. And out of all of that, there were no county dollars to support that, the, that, that debt, except until you get to 2021, that would be a contribution of $43,000. Am I correct on what I just said? Yes. Now again, we just got to recognize that. And I'll hush. Thank you. Okay. So we did run a sensitivity case on 24. Hold on one second. <laughs> oh, get sensitivity. My mouse back control. <laughs> but again, it, I guess we get back. It, the only thing that changed on 24 is we dropped out the dollars in column I. Those went away. Whoa. And in return, or as an effect, column K, we bump had to be increased. All other things are the same. So um, we, we zeroed out that 500 and some thousand a year in column I, and as a result, there's a few more dollars identified as being needed over the next few years in column K. Do... Craig, do you see a need for this page? No. Not, not anymore. No. Okay. So back to 23 to be revised accordingly, as we've discussed. That would, I guess, be our base case current funding plan that reflects the, the school funding agreement. Agreed. That's what we had wanted to go through slide by slide. As I said, there's a number of things in the appendix that you might want to look at, gets into more detail of the CIP <clears throat> rating reports, your individual debt op, uh, schedules, but this was, I think, what we wanted to cover verbally. Well, you were hours up anyway. <laughs> right on time. Yeah. Um, but we'll continue to get direction from staff as you all work through your process and um, be able to update this accordingly. Um, but, but again, I, I know you've got challenges going ahead, ahead of you, but the way you've managed this historically, I think, has set you up to have some flexibility to fund capital as you all determine the priorities to be. It's not an endless ability to fund, but there's, there's capacity and affordability there as you go through this. I have a supposing question. Suppose. Hypothetical. This board was led to believe that we, if we availed ourselves of the lottery, the special lottery fund for tier one, tier two counties, that we would have to give up our lottery dollars and we had already used it to finance the debt. So we just took it off the table. Further questioning, where it was discovered that we would only have to give up our allocation for five years. Correct. And I don't know why we were not told that before, but at any rate. So actually we would give up 1.275 for five years. For five years. If awarded so, the needs-based grant funding. Correct. Right. So we now have entered into an agreement with the school board to apply for that to the tune of $15 million. And I suppose the question is, we're trying to determine if that is a reasonable thing for us to pursue because we have to, first of all, match a, a dollar for every $3. Right. So if it's $15 million, we'd have to put in $5 million. And be, right? be able to spend 20 correct. To be able to spend 20 So actually, if it's a $15 million grant, 
Well, actually, we would have to bring that down to about 18 million, and we would have to put in like four, a little over four million to have the three to one match. But we would also have to give up the 1.2, so that's six billion. So we'd have to, we would actually have 10 million we would have in it over a five year period. Okay. Am I? Are you following uh, let me? me? Look, I, let me just recap. If, if you get the full award of the grant for your tier, you would get fifteen million. Okay. Yeah. Let, let's let's go on. Right. That. And and in order to take advantage of that full fifteen million, you would need to bring five million to the table. So a total of twenty. So you have a total of twenty million that you're spending, fifteen of which is a grant. Correct. Okay, and in, in, in return, you'll be foregoing a million to call it a million three for five years. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right. So five, six, six point five million. Six point five million of lost lottery funds. Correct. Um, so, plus the five million we have to put into it, so we'll have eleven and a half million in. Correct. Follow that. For Twenty million. Yes. Sounds right. 20. So basically, we're going to get uh, nine and a half million dollars. Now, correct, and, and the way this school funding is set up, I think you alluded to it earlier, is you're going to just need to figure out how to handle that school funding, the, the model on page 23, for those years where it's lost. We, we would have to supplant, we would have to find the funding for the 1.2. Right. Right, and those you know those grants we've worked with a number of com of counties that have received it. They're they're usually applications are in the fall. Yep. And if you're awarded, um, you start to lose the lottery money immediately, or that year, even if you're not ready to move forward. Oh, really? Wow. So the clock starts ticking. Now you you have time to use the grant money. Um, it's the, I'm not aware of a deadline that they've imposed. If you're awarded in October, you must start in January. I don't think that exists, but what, what I do know is the lottery money is discontinued maybe the first quarter following the announcement of the grant. Follow? Pardon me. Did you say you have worked with some schools already? Or are you? We have worked with a number of counties that have used this program. So you, you begin to lose the lottery money pretty much upon the announcement of the grant. You have time to spend the grant money. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it's only for new construction. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, it's it, where we've been involved with it, it seems to have worked you know, pretty well. Well, everybody has an opinion on this, and I, I suppose I'm asking for yours. Is that not a reasonable deal for the county to take advantage of that we would actually, even though we've got to forego, we're going to have to find the replacement for the 1.25 uh, on lottery funds for five years, we still would pick up nine and a half million dollars right. through the grant. Right. You look at it over a five-year horizon, right. you're coming out ahead, but there are some years where you've got to rework your cash flows. But let me ask this question. Back to the schools that you are working with. New construction only. Those schools and school systems, were they absolutely show already no. decisions have been made? They were not. They, they, that's what I've seen is that applications were made and approved with sort of very preliminary descriptions of what the project was going to be, but they were not fully designed or bid. In fact, there are counties that are still sitting on the grant money. They, don't, they haven't taken possession of it, but it's in their name, um, but they have not yet moved forward with the project. And I'm not aware of a sunset on the grant at this point, but that may be something that's being discussed. But they're losing their lottery money. Correct. And that began in the year it was awarded. Correct. And my oh. also understanding is that we actually have to put the match up first before we receive 
that those lottery dollars. They're not going to give us their lottery dollars until we actually. I if think it's what they will do is a pro rata draw. So um, when you start construction or you're incurring costs for whatever that project is, it's a three to one match until you. I suppose the meat of it is this: Do you recommend we pursue this? I'd, I'd, I'd like to see what the the cash flow implications are of doing this and, and what we all just jotted down. I'd like to confirm it, but I, I don't think there's any harm in pursuing the award. Now, you can, um, I believe you can turn it down. We can. Um, well, I hope so. <laughs> and, and I think that would be an important, you know, what is the project that this would support? And, and one of the things I've found that's been a little bit of a challenge is, you know, you do you have a project that you legitimately want to spend $20 million on? Because that's what you'll be doing. To fully take advantage of the grant, you got to have something. Well, what we do? We've got a 112 <laughs> year old school, I think, that needs gotcha. to be replaced. As we found in other places, there was a little bit of a disconnect between the project budget and $20 million. And you, you know, you if you don't take the full 15 million, you know, you gotta. It, it, they don't just give you the 15 and the match is less. I mean, you get the gist. So, I, I don't think there's any downside to continuing to move forward with that. I'd like to sit down with Allison and folks and just sketch this out in this debt funding agreement or the school funding agreement. But based on your tier, that's you know, that's. Well, I think we, would need that. We, we need to get some guidance on that because we now have put it forth for them to apply for it. Mm -hmm. We've got the need with, for the school. We've acquired now the property for the school. Uh, so we would need you and Allison to get together and work on how best we could arrive at the dollars necessary that we're going to lose from the lottery funds uh, to do that. So I think we need to examine. Can we use it on more than one project? Uh, it might be two applications. I, I'm not certain. I can. I, I can remember ask we can't that use it for land purchase. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. I know it's new for new construction, but I'm, what I'm getting at is can it be used for two pro You know, right. two, basically, you know, two two locations. Yeah, I, I'll ask that question. It may just be that there's two applications. Um, and I would think you're limited to 15 in a round, or maybe 15 in total. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it's 15 total. Um, All right. If you, if we go for it, well, this is for what five years? For the five years? Five years to give up the lottery dollars. Yeah. Okay. If if they what's, were, what's going to happen if our powers to be in Raleigh changes the rules? <laughs> That's, that's possible. <laughs> that wasn't exactly my greatest concern. My concern was, and this is my question I want to ask you before I even see what my concern is. You're given this exact, you are working with the school system with their finances, advising them as to what they should do or shouldn't do. No, we're not. working with the counties in those places, you're working just with like the county, you are. Just like us. Correct. You, right. In, not in, not, in not advising. You're not, you're not parallel working with the school system no. to say you ought to do this. No, he's our guy. Yes, <laughs> yes that's, that's right. right. I, I, I had just thought of. Yeah, if I, 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 I didn't mean to speak that way. If I did, it <laughs> Well, no, no, no. It was with just that. County. Uh, yeah, it, I just could not remember. <laughs> pardon me for this. I worked with the school system back there, and I could not remember whether I had ever had seen you making such a presentation, not exactly like this, but a brother presentation to them about how to best spend your money. And Mr. Acock, my concern was that not that, that Raleigh would change their mind, but inside our county go to change in their mind about what they needed to have done, Joe. And then we don't have the right agreements to keep moving forward, and then we start losing money because we didn't need, didn't use it. That's my concern: is that we would get out there, 
Well, it had to be earmarked specifically to a project because they're not going to fund it unless it's to a specific well, project. They, that, that may be true, but they can change the rules. I mean, they earmark so much that for the lottery funds for the schools, and then in the middle, middle of the show, they change the rules. And one last question on this before I let you go. Okay. The dollars that we have in leftover in the school designated capital improvement tax dollars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a, lot of, a, lot, a lot of adjectives there. Which is now $1.5, $1 $1.8 million. Right. Can those funds be used for the match? You, you can use, you, all, you cannot use accumulated lottery money. Nope, not accumulated then, then lottery. I think you're fine. We've done some digging on that. A, you, can, you can debt fund the match, or you can cash fund it as long as the cash is not from accumulated lottery. Sales tax, other reserves. Well, it's designated for capital improvements, and if we've got to come up with... Four million, and they got one point five. Then we got to put three point five in. As long I'm trying as it's to not lot, lower as long as it's our, not lottery money. Okay. As long as it's not lottery money. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. And and if if they made an application this year, I, my experience has been you all have to approve it. The school board has to approve it, and awards are made either September one or October one. <clears throat> if you're awarded, that will be in the early part of FY twenty one. Right, and the lottery money would start to discontinue October, November. So this would be an FY21 impact to the budget on the the lottery. And and my very reason to bring that up to see whether or not we can make sure we have provisions in the event that we go this route that we're prepared. Right. Okay. Well, and. We have a, an agreement with the school board, and, and we passed a resolution in support of applying for it. So uh, they're supposed to be working on the project now. So we've already identified the project. So, so I think the takeaway that we've gotten is to um, work on that specifically, right. yeah. sketch out those dollars and those cash flows, and then um, next go round rework this um, $527,000 amount and the, the naming and the description. Correct. Yeah. I'm good. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Your hospitality. I appreciate it. Um, do we need a I, I've got what I have on the budget is, is fairly quick. If you, if you want to go ahead and do that now, or do you need a break? I'm good. Y'all okay? You want a break? You want a break? You want a break? Okay. Keep on. Keep on going. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What we have done, and again, we've got copies of the entire budget here uh, that we'll hand out and give to you. And, and the plan is not to go through every line item today. So what we did was to look at some of the really major things that we could or could not cover. Because we knew that with COVID and, and the loss of sales tax and the loss of revenue, we had to make some major cuts. And, and part of the major cuts was we could go through this and pick out $100 from supplies here, $100 there. We could you know, come up with $50,000. We wanted to look at really some large cuts and make recommendations to you. So, do uh, you have any cut sheets? Uh, we, we call this the cut sheet. So, Dennis will be giving you the cut sheet. The cut sheet. The what? Said he took it out. Said he took it back out. You don't have the cut sheet on my screen? <laughs> oh, it's classified information. Yeah, evidently. Um, at the top of the list is uh, our really our large CIP items. Um, and then we also have our solid waste CIP as well. Again, our solid waste is a enterprise fund. 
What, what, what are you looking at? Uh, the top of the sheet. The, the, the top of my sheet says uh, EMS net vehicle allocation. Right. That, that's uh, 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 part of, that's the CIP. All right, then the EMS net vehicle, again, if we do uh, cut wing net, uh, we can cut one of those vehicles out. So that is a hundred and eighty-five thousand, eighty-seven thousand. So that we will already cut. Uh, we have kept the information uh, technology in at two hundred fifty thousand. The sheriff's vehicles at four hundred twenty-five thousand. And other county vehicle allocation at 175. Basically, on vehicles is what we've done this year. The recommendation is we continue with the CIP. I don't want us to get too far behind that we're playing catch up. How long have we had this plan in place on vehicle replacement? This is year two. This is year two. This is year two. Um, the 4-H van, uh, that would come from Kevin's funds. It's not part of the uh, CIP. They're funds that he already has available through the 4-H program. Uh, again, there's other capital that is included in here, a lot of it dealing with the Sheriff's Department, sewer system replacement, uh, 125000 or, or repairs, not replacement, uh, canine washer and dryer generator. These are still capital items that we need moving forward. What's a throw box? Uh, that is a, sh I will have to get the sheriff to explain that to you. It's uh, one of those things they throw out and it makes the, and they run over with the tires or something. Um, can't That's remember. Right. I can't remember. 15,000, no? Yeah. It, I can get bored with the same to thing with a gun. To make the runaway car. Shoot a tire out. Not only that, but a board will work with nails in it. $15,000? Yeah. I mean, really? Oh, she's going to go find out. Yeah. Uh, but also, the wash and dryer. Now, we just approved a daggum wash and dryer. This will put a back so soon. I'm not sure if this is... There was is... a dishwasher for the detention center. Do you think that maybe was... The washer and dryer for the Maxwell Center, I don't believe, was ever put in. Oh, I didn't know this no. was for the Maxwell Center. I thought this no. was for the sheriff. No. The washer and dryer is for the Maxwell Center. Let's still have a Let me see. Let's find out who is. Yeah, we're, we're still sending that. We, we don't still don't have a place to put a washer and dryer at the Maxwell Center. $40,000 for a washer and dryer. Mm. Don't y'all let my wife see that figure. <laughs> $40,000. What kind of washer and dryer are they doing? Yeah, it's commercial. Big one. Does it have a robot that comes with it? It's got a throw box. Um, that's a throw box. That's what it is. <laughs> But, but what we can do on the capital is we can get the, the sheriff, you know, again, the HVAC unit, um, the sewer, uh, that w was half of it. Um, and why have you got Viper update in here twice? Viper update, 12, yeah. 575, Viper update. <laughs> Viper update, one is for EMS and one, one was for Wayne Nett. Well, we don't need the yeah. wing net. Well, so. we sure don't. <laughs> <laughs> Why would we need Viper update? That's Highway Patrol. I, mean, I, I, I think there was something about inoperability well, you know, that they were trying. It is Highway Patrol. Viper. Yeah. I mean, we've got to have some radios that can go to it, but I mean, yeah. why would Wayne net? Well, we, I mean, we, I know we take we it. Go, I know we take it out, right? But, but why was it even in there? For, my, my understanding was for uh, in, uh, to be able to talk to um, highway patrol as well. There was something about inoperability between agencies. So yeah, yeah. And, and I might be yeah. talking about something I don't know anything about. I may right. not be needed. We, I'm not now, saying it's not needed now. I just I'm just questioning well, why we we can you know again this is not the fact we can get the. But the you just open up Pandora. What is a lead monitor? Sixty-eight thousand, sixty-three thousand dollars. What is that? Lead monitors. Lead How far monitors. are you down? Lead monitors. Okay, lead monitors. What is that? What's that? Are you, that was for you EMS. Oh, that was EMS. Oh, I see. Oh, that EMS. It's EMS. Yeah. 
Yes, well, listen. Now, listen. Just because EMS or the Sheriff's Department says we would want something doesn't mean we need to provide it. Well, and but... They have an expiration date on it. Yeah, well, I, I sure think... there's an expiration date. Well, anytime you buy any software or whatever, they expire in no, three I, years. I think the... It the, says that if you want to read what... Yeah, the, says, those are the cardiac monitor. Uh, these monitors will pace obtain 12 leads, defibrillate... I don't know what that word is, and we'll monitor heart rhythm. This is a state requirement for any paramedic unit. Oh, well, of course, there's got to be a state paramedic. <laughs> Took care of that one. <laughs> but but we can have the department heads. We'll, we'll have the department heads come in and oh, no, no, explain. No, no, no. They've no, already no. classified it whenever it says it, it was a state no. requirement. Um, and if I have a heart attack, I want them to have it. Yeah. <laughs> The um, Viper update says... I said, the, I'll take that stuff off old people. The I Viper will be going to phase stuff. two in 2025 if radios and ambulances are not phase two compliant. Staff cannot communicate with hospitals in North Carolina. We are requested to replace two radios annually. Okay, so the hospital's involved in Viper now. Mm -hmm. That's the, that was the key right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> No. So each radio is six thousand dollars, and over the next what four years we're replacing them, all of them. Mm-hmm. Well, one, two, three, looks like six years. Over six years. Mm -hmm. So it's just not twelve thousand dollars. It's eighty-one. A hundred thousand dollars. And because the hospital has changed, well, let's clarify that. Now. Yeah, let's, let's. We don't know because we don't know. Right. Let's, let's don't go throwing somebody it, under the bus because we don't know. We just need to clarify. Oh, I'm good about throwing people under the bus. <laughs> I'm trying to save you. But but we can let's get some more information. We, and, and we'll have the there. sheriff. And it, this is just the, the overall pick. This is the overall pick. You don't have to make a decision today on whether in or out. This is just the overall picture. Of what's in the CIP? Oh, so we don't have to approve this. You don't have not today. You don't have to approve today. When, when need, do we have to approve it? When, when Come it comes. On. <laughs> uh, we will get you the information that you don't. We'll have the sheriff and also EMS come in as well if you have any questions about uh, something very specific. But this was what was requested and recommended uh, in the CIP. Uh, the thought process was we are making a lot of cuts this year, but this is really the second year of funding the CIP uh, at a consistent rate. We didn't want to get behind. I understand. One okay. last question on it. What in the world is a pictometry? Pictometry. That's for um, revaluation. Excellent. Yeah, they're when they're doing the. I think it's the aerial photographs right. for revaluation. We didn't buy a plane now, did we? <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. We pay for doing taxes and generate. Yeah. We were trying to figure out. It's for the jail. So we pay somebody to take aerial photos. Is that what you say? Yes. Okay. All right. And then, then we have the solid waste capital, and again, that's enterprise fund, and um, they're in, in good shape as far as their fund balance. Um, one of the things we're recommending cutting, uh, you see the positions from election specialist, planning, soil conservation tech. Michelle, uh, before you get to that, the washer and dryer is for the jail, not the Maxwell. It's for the jail. All right. And we didn't just buy a, a, a washer. They've dryer. had it in the budget for several years, no, because they've been breaking down. But they've managed to keep it working. So is that the old jail? And this one over here, I see. That's what I'm saying. The, mm -hmm. the jail, the old jail. Yes. Okay. Yes, right, because okay. I think there is washer and dryer at the carry windows already. Mm -hmm. There it is. Yeah, I didn't know if, that, if it's out of warranty. I figured it's all pieces done out. Yeah. Um. But also, um, we looked at cutting some positions. Uh, you'll see the list of positions we're recommending cutting. Uh, these were open uh, at the time. Right now, these positions are frozen, but in talking with staff, we will just cut these positions uh, from uh, Wayne County. Um, 
and then you'll see the Wayne Net vacancies. That's how many vacancies we have right now in Wayne Net. And again, those positions have been frozen. So we're cutting positions. We, we did not look at cutting DSS, health, or jail, or sheriff's department, as a lot of that was just mandated positions and also first responders. And we had a tough time filling those positions to begin with. Uh, we had a lot of requests for some new positions. Are, uh, there, are there no other positions that, that we can look at as far as cutting? There's no other vacant positions. Right. I, I, well, I didn't say whether they're vacant or not. <laughs> well, we've also cutting, you know, Wayne Net. That's another four. Yeah, well, seven, we're eliminating that whole yeah. department. Yeah. Um, let me just pull it as deadly as I can. Generally, organizations grow by positions <laughs> and sometimes they get over, kind of bloated, let me put it that way. And I'm just wondering if we ask a analyzation of each department as to how critical every position is. Whether it's in, to give you an example, evidently this tax assistant one has been in the tax office for some years uh, and that position has been there, but all of a sudden it's vacant now, so we just are going to cut it <laughs> because it's vacant. <laughs> because it's vacant. And, but, and but they probably didn't need them to start off with because if you're cutting them, they must not be critical to the operation of the department. Well, it, they, I would, they, if you talk to department heads, Every position. Oh, well, every, absolutely. <laughs> how, however, we took a point in time and said these positions were open at this day. We're freezing them as of now, and, and this is what we're doing. You know, we, at we some kind of point, that. there has to be a time of looking to verify that every position is critically that important. I don't care whether or not, whatever organization you're in, you have to do that occasionally. Right. Now, I know, uh, people say I got no heart, uh, and everybody <laughs> that we need to look after every employee, but that's true. But if the position is not needed, right. then we need to find another position for that particular right. person and eliminate it. Right. So I would just ask that we do that. We, 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 and we can go back and work, but, but these were the ones we, we, we off the top. I'm going to give you a whole year to work on it. Okay. <laughs> Come right. next year, this time, okay. I would like to have an, it analyzed to see whether or not these positions are, in fact, that right. critical to the mission of that particular department. Okay. Yes, sir. I, my, that's as delicately as yeah. Joe Daughtery gets. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, we could cut this board back to five. That would, that guess, be, guess, guess that would go home. <laughs> <laughs> one of the <laughs> weeks to go. <laughs> um, that's a pretty good one. That is a good one. If you look as well, we've had some requests for some new positions. Um, at this point, we're only recommending uh, two new positions. Uh, one is uh, the EMS or the 4-H after-school coordinator. That's funded by uh, the fees within that department. Uh, the, they have had high attendance, and so the fees have generated that salary, so we've recommended that. Uh, we're also recommending uh, the uh, QA manager uh, for 911. If we do emergency medical dispatch, we have to have that quality assurance position on staff to make sure that we are uh, having the right protocols and that we're going through emergency management and making sure that our people are trained uh, on EMDs. And that one we really don't have a choice on. We don't have a choice on because what we're on one of two counties in the state that's not doing this. You know, I mean, this is... Uh, this is not mandated, but I mean, this is no brainer. This has got to be done. Right. Um, the Edgewood funding we talked about um, is, is that it will no longer be Edgewood funding. 
we will change that into a half million dollar addition to uh, small capital. The COLA, there is no COLA recommended in this budget. There is no merit recommended in this budget. Um, also, uh, we originally, I think I mentioned to most of you today, uh, before COVID, we were looking at setting aside 500,000 uh, additional in the uh, school system, small uh, capital as a contingency. But uh, we didn't realize that was in there until Allison did a deep dive in the budget over the weekend. We forget, forgot we didn't take it out. So that 500,000 can be removed. Um, one of the biggest things- But aren't we putting that back in? Well, that is the, the quote unquote Edgewood. This was additional, this was above and beyond. Oh, this is beyond. Yeah. Well, again, this if you were looking at the COVID, we this was pre-COVID, we put it in pre-COVID. Okay. So we can remove that. Uh, outside agency funding, <coughs> one of the things, and, and I hate to do this outside agencies, but we needed to look at a reduction. And this is just taking 10% off the top for all outside agencies. Uh, did not go through and, and evaluate if it was a valid or not valid. Just went a straight 10%, tried to be equitable and fair to all. Uh, and then you can see the cut to Wayne Net. Uh, which is 469,000. Uh, travel meals and lodging. What we did with travel meals and lodging is we reduced uh, across the board everybody 50%. The thought process was that people are going to do more things by Zoom, more things by remote and web access. Might as well, you know, that was an easy place. And again, you may have issues such as inspections that may come back with a budget amendment, but we had to go just say 50% from everybody. So we're trying to be equitable across the board on that. That's all county employees? Yes, sir. Including ours. Sir. So the commissioner's got a 50% cut in this also. Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, this is everybody. Yes, sir. This is, if you had a travel and training line item in a department, it was cut 50%. Uh, and then next is what uh, a, a recommendation uh, for uh, an increase uh, for um, uh, EMS salaries uh, after our salary study that. Salary adjustment. Salary adjustment. Um, I had a question on the um, outside agency funding uh, I don't have a problem with the, with the cuts but do we not have a uh, aren't we under a contract obligation with uh, watch and are we not under one with literacy connections I know we did one for watch I think this was the last year of that I think the, the agreement amount. was that they were supposed to be getting an increase to bring them back up. A five thousand dollar. Yeah, five thousand dollar increase. I don't think there was any discussion about what would happen if there was a decrease. And the reason why I did include watching this, if we're doing it across the board, we need to do it across the board. And I don't have a problem with that. I'm just wanting to make sure yes, that sir. there's not anything in place to prevent that. Not that I'm not that I'm aware of. Well, Mr. Parker, yeah. Mr. Parker may know something because you remember the remember the agreement that we had, and you know? I think it was the agreement was among the board members, not. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're right. There, um, was, there, there was nothing in writing between us and Watch. Okay. No, it, was uh, it was a matter in uh, which I withdrew my objections <laughs> to the cuts. <laughs> we we uh, last year, if you remember last year's budget, I think. Watch and the museum were the only two nonprofits that got an increase. So, okay. but but this year there would be you know just a, a straight ten percent. I'm, I'm good with it. I just want to make yes, sure sir. we're covered. Okay. Yes, sir. I'm fine. 
We're going to have reduced revenues. We cannot increase property taxes. We're in a squeeze like every county uh, period. And, and there is no recommendation for a property tax increase. Now, help me read this list that you have here. You've got down here at the very bottom, negative 522.087, the bottom figure. What does that mean? If you do all the things in the far right-hand corner, you would, we would use no fund balance and, in fact, but we have to reduce our revenues or make a balance. You would not use any... Fund balance at all. Zero fund balance. If we went that, would be put that in a contingency. We, you would put that to balance it off. Mm -hmm. You just have a contingency of five hundred thousand, and we need something and contingency to cover us if we get this school grant of the one point two of the loss of the the lottery dollars. Right. We would need some contingency right. there. Um, great. Manager, it had to come from somewhere, yes, sir. Because I think we're going to get the grant. Yeah. I mean, we're going to put some pressure on some folks up in Raleigh to do that because we need the school. It's, it's and but, we, if we got $9 million in free money, we'll just have to. And, and I, I do want to say the, these are unprecedented times. It is. These are tough cuts. Yeah. But it, these are cuts, and, and, and we've talked to staff, and, and I appreciate Janice and Chip and Allison, and we, we really have put our heads together to look at every way to cut, but also try to be equitable as well. And, and um, if you talk to our employees, they understand. They're, they are grateful to have a job. They are very happy to have a job. You know, you have to remember, we've had some increases as well. Health insurance went up 8.9%. You know, that's already in your budget book. Yeah. You know, uh, state retirement went up an additional 2%. That was 440000 That's about right. Yeah. About an additional, four, that's a fixed cost. So along with the increases that we've had, we're still making a lot of cuts. So it, it's, it's been a weird time but I appreciate everybody's willingness to really try to do the right thing. Let, let me ask the question I want to make just sure that uh, no uh, the way of course of something travels has changed. When we're talking about getting the money for the school we are talking about the school that was on the priority list yeah. that was the free one. Free okay. I want to make sure that yeah. no, yeah. we're not going to no, make sure. Nah. You know, I, you know, yeah. I, I didn't want to make make sure there hadn't been some telephone conference or something I had missed. I just want to make sure. The, the only I, the only discussion was Greenwood, and remember we applied for that additional money from the feds. feds. However, there's only fifty million dollars through the whole country. All military schools, and I think we asked for ten. Yeah. I doubt we're going to get it. <laughs> but but as, as, as I told Allison, we're on the list. <laughs> we're, we're, we're on the list. Well, so. That's right. I understand if you don't even get on the list, you're, not, right. you're not even considered. Yes, sir. So, you know. But let me also say, this is not the be-all and end-all of cuts or additions. This is not the be-all. This is really what's recommended at this point moving forward. Well, I, th I think you're leaving out the fact that during your budget discussions with individual departments, you found other cuts as we well, did. and those are incorporated they in are. your recommended yes, budget. Sir. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, it's not what they asked for. I, I did have um, a conversation yesterday with 
the chairman of Gateway. Gateway. Um, years ago, we s solved the deficit that the county portion of Gateway had by redoing the percentages that they had. That was definitely uh, to the favor of the city and definitely to the detriment of the county. And in doing so, they built up a huge reserve. In fact, can you find out what that reserve is? Sure. Um, that reserve is rather large. But in addition to that, they are charging our county budget every time there's a no-show out there in the community. So if DSS schedules a pickup through Gateway and they go to pick that individual up, and that person's sick or for whatever reason does not ride, then the county gets charged for that trip. Now, some of these trips are up to $400. So if that person, is, as example, was scheduled to take a trip to Greenville for dialysis or whatever, and it's $400, and they don't make the trip, they've been charging the county budget $400. Yeah. Even though they don't go. Who right. voted that in? We just found out about uh, it. We just found out about it. This has been going yeah. on for years. Going on for years. And it yeah. has amounted to about 40 grand. Yeah, how much was it uh, last 60. year? Yeah. 60 hours. That's about the no shows. 30, 30, 30, 30. 30. last year, and I think 20 some so far this it's, year, but we were expecting it. 20, yeah, 28. It's 28,000 this year so far. Mm -hmm. So, you know. This is this is uh, this is money we should have figured out how Gateway's making profit now. Then, <laughs> well, that's they were already making a profit. Yeah. So at any rate, what I am asking is that we give a nod to the county manager to inform them that we are no longer are going to pay for that. The, those departments going to have to handle something with them, but we're not going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. It's not right that we. First of all, we already. We're already paying for it. Yeah. Well, well it's like double dipping. One of the things we do have in the budget, there is, uh, they get new vans. We're required to pay the 10% match for the vans, and it's $60,000. That's $60,000. Right. For new vans, in addition to the 40000 that we got to pay. Right. Well, um, when, when we need to eliminate that. We don't, we're not talking about negotiating. That fee. We're talking about eliminating. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. The most that the most that anything ought to happen like that is is the exact amount of gas it took to go out there. Well, to I, agree. I agree. And the hourly rate that the man who was driving the field. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these municipalities, some one in particular, you know, person mis cut paying the water bill. They got this enormous fee that you got to put it back on. That's like making some kind of a profit. Yeah, you, you don't get your grass cut on some lot. They charge this in. It's crazy. We don't need to run away costs, run away charges, run away fees. I run, mm, run away fees and to the tax. I can't, yeah. I can't believe. Are you finding that what? out? Yeah. Um, I that have a question. Crazy. I thought I had a copy of their audit, but I did not have okay. it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thirty-two thousand dollars last year. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> now, can I ask you who is paying for the SROs? We're paying part of it. There's grant funding. We're paying part of it. Um, part of them grants are going to run out, there. Mm. and you're not going to do away with the SROs. Right. I can't remember the right now the cost of that SRO is right School now. resource office. Yeah. School resource office. It's 710,000 a year. Yeah. Do what? I was about to say. It's 710 from the school system that they get from the state, but that doesn't cover the whole program. No. We the rest. Does the school give those dollars back to the county? Yes. So we do get the dollars. Right. We have a contract with them for the services. And it's attached to it as that amount, that's $710,000. But each one of them has got to be here, too. Well, you know, I constantly keep hearing how Wayne County government is not funding our school system. 
but you got to put the whole package together. And school resource officers is one of those. So we need to determine how much the overall cost is, how much we get reimbursed, and then how much the county actually pays. Because that is an actual, a funding from us to them. If, if you remember after, was it the shootings in Lakeland, Florida? Yep. We added four additional, that happened right at the time. School security was a very big issue. We added on four additional uh, SROs at that time. Yeah, there it is. So you will right see there. on your screen um, this that total grand total at the far right is what the total is for the school resource officer departments, one million three hundred two seven ninety five, and then when I subtract the um, funding we receive from the schools, that gives us a balance of five ninety two seven ninety five. So close to six hundred thousand that the county is putting into that program every year. But you see, that's kind of falling between the cracks. We're not getting credit for that additional six hundred thousand dollars. Correct. Well, they don't. They don't know it. So we have got to make sure that our message gets out there of how much we actually are, whether or not it's that or any additional funding in addition to the other dollars that we're paying them. Uh, one question I need to ask. We need to let the nonprofits know of the change in funding before the public hearing. Uh, are we okay? Are we live, are we live right now? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. yep. They know it. <laughs> <laughs> when I leave here, I'm going by USA and get my number changed. <laughs> uh, we will send out letters to all nonprofits, and you will be getting phone calls. Just let you know. I've already had a discussion with this. And how did that discussion go? She asked me how to lose the win. I said, I don't know yet, but it's funny. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> I just told her it was going to be a really tough thing. You know, every time I didn't know. As a matter of fact, I had gone over there to sign a document, and then I came over here and met with them. That's what I learned. Won't come as a complete shock to her. But we would, we have budget books ready for you. Um, we can uh, meet again and go through the book as much as you would like to. Um, or if you, there's additional cuts that you feel like need to be made. We'll be glad to look at that as well. If you need additional information on the CIP, we can have our department heads come and give you those explanations as well. Do you have, well, obviously you must have it, the whole book? Yes, sir. Electronic book? Y yes, sir. That I can access it from home? Yes, sir. Um, mm -hmm. Well, is it, is it going to be up? I thought it was online. We, so I can get it for you. I didn't really want to have to drag this. Okay. Well, that'd that be great. Would you send me one, too? Yes, sir. Okay. And me, we'll and send, too. We'll send too. an right. electronic copy to everyone. And yeah, it'll, sure. it'll be like your re just your revenues and expenditures. Like, if you, it won't have all the tabs, but, you know, I mean, you can search by word and things like that. I just don't want to have to drag it. Sure. Right. Okay. No, no, no. We can get that for you. Yeah. So, so that we're or, or like mine. <laughs> You are now going to compile your recommended budget. Yes. And you're going to present that to us at the budget public hearing. At the budget public hearing. Yes. But you could release that whenever you compile it. Yes. So you could release it tomorrow if you get it right. Yes. And I would do that. I'd go ahead and get it released. Uh, the sooner you release it, because you'd have to have it out there for some public comment. Right. right. Right? right? So how many days do we have to have it released before the well, the public hearing? The, when you uh, set this public hearing, you're going to say that it is, has been released and it's on your website. And it will be on the website? By the time the thing is published. Today? No. So no? no. Today, it will not be. By, it'll be published on Friday. And so... Um, so by some before we publish it, it will be on there by Friday before it's published. It will be on there. It will be on the website 
sometime Friday before the public hearing notice is published in the Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Okay. Because we, it, it's still going to take a little while to go back and, and add. I understand. Right. So. Yep. And with that being said, then on, we'll have the public hearing, mm -hmm. have comments, mm -hmm. at, which will be on June the 2nd. Yes, sir. And if any commissioner has discovered <laughs> two or three hundred thousand dollars in there we can make adjustments before actually approving right. and adopting the budget right and and if there's additional meetings that you feel like you need oh no or, i don't think we need yeah. to have any more meetings <laughs> i mean okay. but what i'm saying is we can still modify yes, yes at any time between june 2nd and june 3rd or until we vote it we're going to vote it in the second mm -hmm. meeting in june oh well that's all but you even at, as long as it's done by june 30th we're good okay Okay. And what we were even, we had even extended it. That was an interim budget. Yeah. 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 That, that would be just at the level you're doing now. Yeah. So I, I don't want to do that. that. I just remember just doing that. Right now, right now. We will vote. I would say this. Uh, <laughs> if you would assist us, because you're right, we're going to get a lot of pushback on the nonprofits. And I would ask that you take another strong look and see if there's any way that we can find the additional hundred thousand dollars cut somewhere else in order to maintain those well, and if they're, uh, if they're and not there they're would, not there an option would be if we have the half million dollars in contingency have a four hundred thousand dollar contingency no i don't like that option i don't really think but to have the half a million in contingency you got to do away with all the cip well, not only that, but I'm telling you, we're going to get this grant on this Fremont school. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea that we are going to give up the funding on lottery this well, coming up budget. If, if we add back the 30000 from DSS on, on the no-shows, and there may be a couple other things, we'll, we'll take See whether or not, yeah, just take a so look. So your, your recommendation would be, or not recommendation, your request would be, if we could look at not cutting the non or keeping not an increase for any of the nonprofits, keeping them the same, that would be your preference. Yeah, and I know there's people in the community who are going to turn around and say, Did that idea come from Joe Daughter? <laughs> But, <laughs> well, but I think we need, do need to exactly. We'll, 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 we'll check. I, we'll I, don't check have, I don't have a problem with that if they can find a way around it. Right. Are you guys? We'll, we'll check and see. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, under that uh, Viper update, this 12500 Yes. It was already budgeted. Well, that's true. Yeah, yeah that's, you, that's well, you, you don't have as much as you That's thought. right. Well, and again, we, there, we got to get back through, and, and yeah. there, there's some moving around things. I mean, that will be help. I mean, yes, sir. It will help some. Yeah. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, y'all can work it out, right? We'll, we'll try to work it out. And anybody else? Yeah, that? right quick. Yeah, not nothing to do with the budget. The letter that we got from the lady concerned about the calls for, for the EMS. Oh, uh -huh. uh, I love technology. Sometimes there's been no code calls in her neighborhood. Our people has verified that. We only have one fire department in the county that that has a first responder program that's Marmac. She does not live in Marmac's district. <laughs> uh, her last name and her husband's last name is different. Uh, I mean, you know. Okay. Just for information. Our people's yeah. on top of it. Right. Is, um, Dave's got a place plan in place. <laughs> is, well, is, is anybody have anything else? Now what we gotta do is um, we we have to have um, we got to set up a mo we I need a motion for the public hearing. For June the second at 9:30 a.m. on our budget. Yes, sir. I need need for that. Yes, okay. Have a motion um, for the public hearing for our budget for June second at 9:30 a.m. All in favor, raise your right hand, please. We are unanimous. Uh, is there any other business to come before the commission? Anyone I, have any comment? I do. Yes. I just want to let you know, uh, fellow commissioners, that the reason we're not here for hours going through this budget is that I did attend the work sessions. I was very cognizant of y'all's time, 
<laughs> and I did attend the work sessions and uh, I got a lot of my questions answered at that time. And I appreciate the county manager inviting me. Uh, he even fed me breakfast and lunch. Yeah. <laughs> but we, uh, the chairman was also there uh, yeah. as well. And we gained a lot of information talking directly with the department heads. So uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm not going through the entire budget we really already have. Well, we did. We spent the time necessary and uh, did the groundwork. And, Bi front. and Bill said he didn't want to sit here for three or four hours going through it. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's, uh, I don't have that much energy anymore. Okay. Does anyone have any others? Okay. We are adjourned. Thank you.